<laughs> welcome back to the Air Insights Podcast. I'm here with Devin Taggart from Crisis 24. Devin, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. This is, this is exciting. I'm stoked to have you because uh, you share a lot of the same uh, career path kind of challenges that I've I've faced as sort of a business owner, but mm-hmm. also as an operator. And you're working in the very specific world of uh, executive protection, but more from the corporate and even the global level. Um, you, you guys are kind of all over all over the world at this point, oh, thousand employees mm-hmm. strong. That's a big company. It's a lot to manage. And I'd love to dig into a little bit of, of that as well as kind of what the day-to-day looks like. Maybe you can enlighten us on what's happening in the world of... Um, EP right now, and particularly on the business side, because it is one of the largest growing up um, now, like markets and mm-hmm. uh, I guess employment markets and in, in the world at the moment. So, anyway, lots to cover. Yeah, yeah. Good. I'd love to find out a little bit more about you mm-hmm. and kind of how you got into this. So I think you've, you're coming at this from maybe a little bit of a different angle than than uh, what most people might think, uh, just in terms of your background personally. So maybe we hear a little bit about that first. Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, it's it's funny. Uh, everyone always assumes when they hear executive protection, the next thing is, oh, you're former military. Right, or and, law enforcement. Or law enforcement. Right. Um, and that's not me. Um, so I grew up in uh, Idaho, you know, just kind of small kid, small town sort of deal. And um, always wanted to get out. Like, I love Idaho, but just I wanted to get out of the small town. And I ended up going to school in Arizona and uh, kind of found my way around eventually you know, criminal justice degree, political mm-hmm. science degree, okay. which like they should really put those with communications because they're useless degrees. <laughs> like, <laughs> So was the goal to be a cop? The goal, so this is wild. So initially I wanted to do like biomedical, but with a focus on pathogens. And okay. I got in and I did a semester of biology and a semester of chemistry. Nope. And I, <laughs> I asked the professor, I was like, hey, how long before we do actual medicine? And they're like, eight years. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's, that's not me. That's right. not me. Got so- it. Um, I kind of pivoted, um, took the part where I wanted to look at like the pathogens, the, you know, sort of, I guess, terrorism, but like that national security approach and just went, okay, criminal justice and political science. Uh, I, I want those. I want something I can talk about when I go out with friends, not something where I'm like, hey, how about those electrons bouncing off of, and you know, no one knows what they're talking about. All right. So I really wanted to focus on something that was relevant and, uh, you know, I was a 9-11 kid. Um, you know, I, I was just old enough to remember a lot of that. And so it really impacted my youth. And so I was really passionate about being involved in security and and what ultimately became protection. Um, and so with that, I was, when my program, I needed to do an internship. And all the internships are like, go to the clerk's office, you know, fill out paperwork. Fill out the form, yep. yeah get coffee. And I, and I just didn't want to do that. So, um, at the time I was also going through EMT school. Um, I was an EMT. Uh, so Arizona has a volunteer EMT program. So I was volunteering as an EMT. And then I went to, um, executive security international. So it's a, uh, 30 day residency program. And I used that as my internship and that's an executive protection nice. school. So and, you get to leverage both things. Mm-hmm. All right. Great. Yeah. And so that was my first introduction to it. And from there, it really was a jumping off point. Um, I made some contacts and because of the EMT side that I've been working as an EMT, they really kind of recruited me into, Hey, we have some clients that would like some medical support. Someone who's dedicated, you should apply for this company, Gavin DeBecker and associates. Okay. And so that's kind of how I jumped in going in. I was like, I think the second youngest person to join the company ever. And how old um, was that? 20, I just turned 22. Wow. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, that's young. Really young. Uh, I think the youngest was like 21 in a couple months. And I was like 10 months older than that person. Wow. I mean, that's just young period. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that gives a lot of insight to how fast things can happen and mm-hmm. being in the right place at the right time. But if you're hiring 22 year olds to take on well, quite a bit of liability and responsibility, um, they have a strong need. Yeah. It was. And and I think also like I was always a little bit more ahead. Like I was mm-hmm. always looking at the what's next, um, you know, in terms of college and everything. So I was always working. I was always trying to learn and and fill in the blanks and the gaps and uh, just wrote education with, you know, EMT programs, things like that, going to ESI. So I'd had more exposure. Um, and so I, I kind of fit in real well. And it's interesting, you know, it's timing is everything. Mm-hmm. I really wanted to do federal law enforcement, like really bad. Um, you know, did the 
I went and took the border patrol exam, like being in Arizona, they push a lot of people to border patrol. So I went and took that. Um, I had a internship lined up with the marshals. I had an internship lined up with the DEA. Um, and it was really kind of like burgeoning. And then all of a sudden they cut everything off the hiring freeze. Yep. Hit. Um, and so it was done. And it's interesting. You look at careers, like where would we have gone? At that point, I thought like, well, this, this sucks. Like this is five years worth of time that I'm going to have to just Eat. wallow and, mm -hmm. you know, not, not know what to do. Maybe local law enforcement, which was never a passion of mine. It's a passion for other people, but it was something that even at that age, I knew if I'm not passionate about it, it's not the job for me. Yep. Um, and then I kind of fell into EP and it clicked and it just took off. So for me, what started as medical support, um, grew into a larger now almost 10 year career. So, uh, okay. kind of been an interesting journey. Um, I always, I, I said, I didn't want to commute to an office when I joined. <laughs> and the first thing they did is, uh, I commuted to an office, uh, as part been of there, done that. Yeah. And yeah. so it was, it was kind of an interesting growth where I kind of, I, I really matured. Um, you know, I was put in situations that I wasn't maybe ready for, but I had a good team around me that, that really kind of helped push me into it. And, and I grew into management level pretty quick. Um, and then just continued from there until I finally pivoted to a training side because I always had a passion mm -hmm. for teaching and then slowly worked my way until, you know, now I'm the director of training for Crisis 24. Which catches us up to date on, on what you're doing. So director of training, I'll circle back to that. When you came in, you said you were learning some lessons and there were some people there to take care of you and mentor you. And what are, what, what are those lessons at that point in life? Like, what are the real things that you're learning there? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's everything that a, a young kid is learning at that point mm -hmm. from, you know, I was living alone in a city where I had no support structure. So how, how do you provide and still have a life for yourself? And then how are you successful in a job where you don't know anybody and you, it's kind of new, you know, like there's no, you don't go to school for, um, like coding and then you become, you know, like a computer engineer and you've kind of, it's, it's a jumping off point with EP. It's very much on the job learning. Like you can think that you're prepared, but the reality of domestic executive protection work is that a lot of it is learning how to do it on the job. Mm -hmm. um, every client's unique. You learn that right away. And so what works with one client won't necessarily work with another. So it was kind of learning, okay, how do I navigate this? And as a young guy with a young guy's ego, you learn to check that really quick. Uh, yep. And so that was, that was an interesting point. And, you know, I had some really good managers around me and some really good people who had kind of been there, done that. Um, and they really helped me like, figure out like, Hey, here's, here's some things that you're doing well. Here's some things you need to work on both on the tactical. I'm going to use tactical. Like I hate that word, but like I hear you, the, the I physical tactical side, as well as in life, you know, how do you be an adult? Yeah. How do you manage like company politics? Yeah. How do you manage interpersonal relations? Uh, things like that. So it was really, it was really interesting, kind of very quick trial by fire learning point for me. So I think it's very similar. I mean, I can really relate to that particularly. And so I went through sort of a similar college career experience. I was heading a certain direction. I was like, yeah, that's not really for me. I really wanted to get to work and start to, to learn. Um, the kinesthetic guy, like put me in coach, I will figure this out mm -hmm. and I'll figure, and if I have questions, I'll ask and please tell me when I, I'm messing up here and I'm, a, you know, whatever else. But I can relate this to the fitness business quite a bit in that, you know, if you're trying to become a coach or a leader or a manager or whatever within a, um, like a, an operation in a fairly large one, which I got involved in a few years after I kind of started in the business, it is trial by fire. It's get on the floor, let's get some stuff done. And, and, and you're going to make mistakes. And hopefully there are people, there's a leadership structure and a framework to kind of pick you up along the way and make sure that you're not getting yourself into too much trouble. But there is, there is so much value in messing up, right? While you're learning how you're uh, to your point, uh, and this is what I said, not what you said, uh, learning how to be an adult, mm -hmm. right? Like you go to school as a kid and going to school, right? And showing up to whatever it's elementary, junior high, high school, whatever, and even college for that matter, is about learning social dynamics. Mm -hmm. It's about conflict resolution, conflict, conflict management. It's about, uh, it's growing up, it's falling down. It's getting up, you know, brushing yourself off and jumping back in the game and doing that for yourself, learn how to do it. And this might sound really elementary, but I think these are huge missing pieces to, you know, where we are sort of. And when I look at the bigger picture as where we're as an economy, what's going on with the job market right now is people don't, didn't, or 
learn these lessons the same way you did mm -hmm. and didn't have people, more importantly, along the way to help you learn those what those lessons in the way that you did. So your trajectory, right? Minus the velocity. So we'll leave that alone mm -hmm. for a second. Your trajectory up the chain and being able to move into more of a leadership position, being offered these different uh, opportunities and then being in a position to take advantage of them when they were they were presented to you is that's almost like people forget or those that are younger these days. And I'm sure you have stories of people that are coming to the EP world now. They're like, well, Devin did it this way. So I want to do it that way, mm -hmm. but they're not prepared the same. Can you speak to that a little bit and kind of what you're seeing from a, maybe a cultural perspective? Yeah, I think uh, it, it's a really good point because we have seen a bit of a shift and it's interesting in that we, the, the way that we were doing things as, as an EP industry and, and a company 10 years ago is not the way we do things now. And a lot of it too is employee management. Um, we were worked hard, real hard um, when we first started. And, and I, it's not one of those back, back in my day kind of speeches, you know, snow up to my waist, uphill, both directions. It's, mm -hmm. it's not one of those. It was just legitimately. It's different now. It was, it's different now. Mm -hmm. You know, we were constantly um, doing shifts and we, we, we called them, uh, it was like a, a company day. Like you donate your day off to the company because you'd be on a night shift. You get off at 6 a.m. And technically getting off at 6 a.m. Having been awake for 12 hours the night before, you started your day off. And then you would go back and you would work the next day. So your day off is your turnaround. You're trying to get back in the swing of like, okay, now I'm switching to day shifts. And you sometimes do that multiple times in a week. It's rough. And it, was, it was working 60, 80 hours. Like we had people pulling 44 days in a row. Um, like I did 19 in a row constantly. The cumulative fatigue of that is going to take its toll. Right. Right. I mean, you can do it for a little while. Right. Right. And you can even not complain about it. But after a while, whether you like it or not, yeah, that, that, that adds up. It does. And you know, we saw a lot of burnout, you know, guys who were just like, this is, this isn't for me. Like I I'm leaving, I'm going somewhere else. I'm going to a different career. But then you saw a lot of people who like that, that crucible, they, they really compressed them and it really turned them into something that it's was value, yeah. right. And, yeah. and so that was a very interesting kind of thing to see is even guys coming out. Like, uh, I joined the company with, uh, you know, guys who are former Marines. Um, one guy was force recon. One guy was, uh, uh, what are the fast teams or the, you know, um, the guys who respond and they're, they're held up for, uh, you know, incidents around embassies around the world, okay. um, Rangers, things like that. And even so the, the density of the life that we were living was, we always said it was like, uh, we called it Gavin years. Um, uh, cause we were with GDBA. <laughs> right. So it was a, a year with Gavin was very dense. Um, and it's the same thing now. It's just different because we're more aware of the toll that it took. Um, you know, a lot of guys, had issues with relationships, mm -hmm. with um, constant travel and, and holding down, you know, their personal lives. Um, some people went as far as to just cut off completely and they would just Airbnb their way around. You know, they'd get off at New York and they'd just get Airbnbs and live there. And then they'd take New York to, you know, Paris, work in Paris, and then Airbnb there. You know, they just weren't living a real life. They were living a work life, which is great for a young guy. But everyone sort of started after about two years it was tough. Yeah. The you know? toll, the toll is taken. Exactly. And so now we've kind of pivoted where a lot of what we're doing now is, is based on how do we get longevity? So how do we take it and, and get the same kind of, um, you know, employee building approach where we're getting guys a lot of experience, you know, we're moving, um, cause there is, it's a high turnover industry. How do we lessen our turnover by, you know, not pushing people to the limit and beyond it? but still get that employee building and that, and that employee growth in that relatively quick amount of time. And it's this, it's this kind of interesting balance that we're trying to do. Yeah, it is interesting, especially if you came up the other way. Mm -hmm. So going back to your statement about, well, I'm not trying to say it's the walk uphill both ways and in, in the snow mm -hmm. up waist deep, it is different. And so it's, it is kind of hard to, re to relate sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for me even, uh, because I grew up the same way, you know, it was just, this is what you do. And you just go to work and you work hard. Now, mm -hmm. on the back side of that, there was a reward uh, for the the work that we were putting in. It mm -hmm. just, or uh, that I was putting in. Like, I was a performance-based guy. Like, I know when the number gets here, like, I get paid. So, uh, this is the sacrifice I'm, um, I'm willing to make right now mm -hmm. to get there. But, but again, if you didn't come up that way, you don't understand it. So, there is a dichotomy that we're trying to balance right now. The old versus the new. Right. Uh, the old school kind of new school. And, uh, the, it's the qualities that you have to build into somebody at a much different 
pace and they almost have to be told rather than uh, their ability to uh, recognize it on their own, be self-aware enough. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't, I guess the question is for, for me, like in that situation, how, how, what are you doing to be successful with that uh, at the pace that you need to be successful with it to continue to keep in the business moving forward mm -hmm. and put the right things in the right places for the wheels to turn? Right. So, and that, and that's kind of what we're, we're figuring out still is how do you get people who are really good guys where you see a good future for them? Um, you're like, hey, th this person is really well qualified. They have the right mentality. They have the right innate skills or, or abilities but maybe they don't have that, that kind of rough edge yet. Um, we call it like they've got to knock the shine off still. You know, they, they, they show up, they're new, regardless of what they've done in the past. You know, if we get someone who's a veteran from the EP industry, it's a little different. But if you, even if they're coming out of law enforcement or the military, sometimes they have a shine on them where, you know, either around someone who is an influential person where you've only seen them on Twitter or on TV or in the movies. Oh, gotcha. And they get a little as a client, you mean. as a client. Yeah. And, and so these, you get around them and it's a little like they're a little too new still. And so they may be ready in the near future for a leadership position, but we've got to knock that shine off what we call kind of sand those edges down. So they're a little more, you know, salty kind of, they're ready to manage other people and they're ready to make harder decisions rather than just like, yeah, we're going to go like, let's just do it. Let's just, you know, maximum effort this all the way through. No, how can we manage the protective operations? How can we manage, um, the, the client expectations and how can we sometimes tell clients, no, we need that person who has that ability and that, that experience. So again, it's kind of getting these people into mentorship situations where okay. they've got a good mentor They've got someone who's like, hey, this is the guy. This is one of our next guys. Let's invest in him um, and then keep him going as well because we want to push him to succeed. But we also have to be aware that, you know, just because the way I did things back when I joined or we joined of like, well, you know, why is he say, why did he say no to this travel? Why is he not traveling? Well, because he has a new kid, you know, and I was 22. I didn't have a kid. My girlfriend at the time, now my wife was at law school uh, in, in Washington. So I was living basically alone. I could afford to just push, 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 push. Mm -hmm. Not everyone can do that. So it's also working with them to kind of say, Hey, how can we make this? Like, we need you to get here. You're currently here. Like, what can you give and how can we make this work so that we can get you to this point? Yeah. So uh, what I hear you saying, and this is so familiar to me, man, I, it, and, and so it's so e you can so easily get frustrated in the process uh, at on both ends, right? As the new person coming in who doesn't understand anything about what, why I, I want to work, like I want to do this, or I had the training, I took the course, I got checked off, I'm ready to go. And then on the other side going, I know what the course taught you because I wrote the course and this was the basis, you know, this is the basis for now learning how to really do the job. And, and also keep your mouth shut for a little while, be humble, you know, eat that humble pie for a while, you know, and, and, and don't try to promote too fast. Don't mm -hmm. try to come up through this so quickly. You need to sit in this for a while and kind of take it all in and to your, 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 the way you put it was knock the shine off or become mm -hmm. a little saltier and know that this is the job and you need to learn the job before you can move on. And that seems to be the rush, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, I'm ready. Let's go. They want to do all the cool stuff. I refer to that as like, you're a, you're a white belt trying to do black belt shit. Mm -hmm. Stop. Like, just stop. We, we have to go through this process. So the, the, one of the challenges you have as a company or kind of one of the things that I'm sure you're dealing with right now is because there's been some mergers and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have to go into too many details, but if you want to give some context, cool. But now there's this like, hey, there, there's all, there's a million ways to skin a cat or nine different, you know, whatever, right? To skin a cat. Like, but not, there is no one way, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got to figure out a way as a company to be more efficient and effective with this that is a large undertaking and effectively you're in the driver's seat for that right now. Can you talk a little bit about that on some of the things you guys are doing? Yeah, absolutely. And and that's a good point to bring up is, you know, we, a lot of my career I spent with Gavin DeBecker um, for better and, and worse. You know, there's, there's great things like I, I respect the heck out of the mission there and, and what, what they're doing still and, and what the lessons were imparted. But a, a year ago, 60% of Gavin DeBecker was, was, sold and allied is the term we're using, allied with Crisis 24. So it became this larger entity. And then with that, Patriot Group just joined. Uh, X, we call them X, XGS, XFAM was another company, X Patriot Group. And we're all kind of aligning into this one company. Um, and, and with that, it's fulfilling this kind of 
this this larger block of the kind of tip of executive protection for the larger Garda World, which is our parent company. Garda World has obviously like Garda Federal, Garda Cash Services, and Crisis 24 is being set as this is the executive protection element of this larger company. And with that, when you bring in, so there's three three executive protection companies plus a threat analysis and and world political analysis companies in World Aware or what was for World Aware. Now it's integrated risk management. Um, and then we brought in an artificial intelligence company to help ease that and, and enhance the ability of these analysts. You're adding all of those capabilities in. A lot of moving pieces. A lot of moving pieces, a lot of leadership that are different. A lot not, of talent. Not yeah. bad, yeah. but just different. You know, yeah. everyone does things different. And that's why this three company approach of this XFAM, XGS, X um, Patriot Group is interesting because there's three companies that have excelled in what they do that are all slightly different. So everything was angled a different way, which is what makes it a really big powerhouse, which we're really excited about. But it also makes internally some things difficult of like, okay, how do we get alignment? Like what is what does one group do well that another group maybe doesn't do as well, but how do we get that integrated? Because it all doesn't fit exactly like a puzzle. And so that's kind of where we're working now. And, and it's interesting because initially you think it only affects the upper levels because it's all just policy, but it doesn't. Yet it affects a lot of people below it. And it's how do we make this positive, you know, a positive effect, not a negative effect. So things like training opportunities, that's a big part of what I'm trying to push because to me, training and standards are what unify a company. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's an easy way. And we've had discussions across the entire spectrum of leadership of training is an easy way to bring all of the people together. You know, we, I always say if, if you're on a range and it's hundred degrees out and you're miserable and you're standing next to somebody doing the same things, you're doing advanced medical training, you're running a PRT, you're doing driver training and you're being thrown around in the back seat and you just want to be sick because you're, you know, the G force and the sharp turns, but you're next to someone that maybe you didn't know, you know, the last week, this week, you know, them and you have this shared experience, it's going to bring you together and it's going to bond you. Yeah. The, the suffering together brings mm -hmm. the growth together to some right. extent. And it also is like, a, it's like the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care what your experience is. We're both sick right now. Right. Like, you know, or we're, yep. you know, we're both really, we're both excelling at this drill right now. Somehow we wound up next to one another and we are the, we are the best shooters in this group. And you, mm -hmm. you have that common bond of that relationship. The other part about it is, is it's just the physical aspect of it. It's not the social dynamic piece in that particular case. I mean, there could mm -hmm. be other, you could be doing some training in that, but getting people out and moving uh, and, you know, sort of away from the, uh, again, the, the, like the, the communication stuff, it's more like, Hey, let's do stuff. Let's, let's improve our hard skills. Mm -hmm. The hard skill training I would imagine in your, in your field is what people want to do. It's like being on the floor with our trainers. Like I can mm -hmm. tell them all day long about sales training or how to connect with a, with a client, how to make an effective phone call, send an effective email, you know, all those kind of things, market themselves a little bit differently. I'll lose them in 15 minutes at yep. max. I mean, they already have ADD. They're, mm -hmm. they're code. They want to be moving and doing stuff, but I take them out there on the floor. We could go five hours, you know, with physical training stuff and where you're dumping new skills onto them and you're testing them and training them and they're just fired up. Right. And then they want to tell everybody about it and they mm -hmm. practice it. Uh, so I imagine it's, it's very much the same. Man, it's the exact same. We have the same problems is, uh, as an industry, as an industry. And the interesting thing is we've seen a pivot, but as an industry, we attract people that want to be doing they want to be out moving like, like me. I don't want to, I, I was asked in my interview, like what's, why did you want to join this company? And I said, I don't want to commute to an office building. <laughs> you know, like that, that, that right. was me. I wanted to be out doing, I want to be protecting. I want to be right. doing. And the reality is, is that doing is 90% soft skills. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's only 10%, maybe like that's, that's even probably a, a bit high on your hard skills training. Like, do you need it? Yes. And should you train probably more to your hard skills? Sure, I think you should because those are the skills like defensive tactics, firearms, driving training, um, less lethal training. Like all of these skills are things that if something goes wrong, the impact is potentially higher. But soft skills are something that's going to make you successful. How to do the correct advance, how to de-escalate, how to ingratiate yourself with someone, you know, how to, how mm. to, you don't have a badge. You know, we're not secret service or the marshals or, or, um, you know, any of these other GRS, even like an OGA um, mm -hmm. overseas, like we don't have the ability just to walk into and own a space. Like very rarely do I have that authority. There's been a couple of times where 
I was essentially given a God pin where it's like anything that I say, if I'm wearing this pin goes like that, that's what, what happens. And that's only happened a couple of times. So most of the time it's you got to earn your way yeah, in. And, and how do I get you on my side? Because I may be able to tell you what to do, but if you don't want to do it, you're not going to do it as well as if you're like, yeah, I want to be a part of this. Or there's no, you must for you to enforce. Right. Right. Yeah. There's right. no like. And so I think that aspect is, and we've seen a pivot where, um, you know, I think the more that, that practitioners are joining the training space and people who have been doing executive protection, because it's still a relatively new business in terms of the modern executive protection and, and widespread, like you, you touched on, like it's, it's been around for 50, 60 years as a, sure. a industry, but as a widespread, well-known industry, it's relatively new. And as you have practitioners joining the instructor sphere, you're starting to see people pivot from, Hey, let's just go to the range and do some really cool shooting stuff. And let's go do J turns and barricade ramming and pit maneuvers with cars to, Hey, even with those, like, what are the skills we actually need in terms of, of our training? What's the more common stuff, the right. higher frequency stuff that we're going to run into on a regular basis? Right. But yeah. we do, to your point, we do have that problem where, where people don't want to do the slow speed, you know, slow speed stuff. They want to do the high speed. They don't want to go learn about situational awareness, you know, they, like or overseas travel awareness or, you know, a proper advance. They don't want to learn how to do an internet advance. They want to go do an advance. But learning how to do a phone advance where you call and you try and get as much information from, you know, your car as you're driving or from sitting in an office to sitting at home, whatever the deal is, or an internet advance where you're, you're doing Googling and you're going beyond just, you know, the first three uh, layers or, or links, you know, you're going into a deep dive. Mm -hmm. Those are things that are going to set up your physical advance well, but it's boring because you're in front of a computer and you're on the phone versus mm -hmm. you're out like interacting with people right. and things like that. So it's the same as, you know, your trainer's not, not really wanting to learn sales training, right. even though it's a key to growing the business and giving them the opportunity to do more of the cool training of the actual, you know, how to do, you know, physical fitness training or, or, or the, the nutrition, whatever the deal is. If they're good at that, it will grow that side of the business. It's the same with us. If you're good at the soft skills, it will grow your ability to do yep. things that are fun and cool and high speed, but no one wants to do that all the time. You know, some people nerd out on it, but for the most part, it's like, God, even me, I'm just like, I don't really want to spend another situational awareness, like eight hours in a situational awareness class. Which I, which I imagine could lead to some of the burnout, but I want to go back to kind of the, where you're at, right. Mm -hmm. And how you got to where you were and you were talking about the lessons that you learned. And it sounds like most of the lessons you learned that were the most impactful for you were those lessons early on, which have now put you in a position where, so you have this, again, this, now you have three different companies that are kind of all angled a little bit differently. And you know, not wanting to commute to an office and what are the skills that you're going to need as a company? Who are the leaders that you need to have in place and how do those leaders need to interact with one another where you already have maybe some executive, you know, leaders that have obviously in those three different, you know, tiers that we just, mm -hmm. you know, call them tiers as far as companies. Now you have to have some one person come in and try to get them aligned on just the training game. So that's, I mean, that's a huge undertaking. The, the soft skills, that you need to be to be able to do that effectively, to have conversations again, earn that trust, earn that respect. I forget the term that you use there, but you don't have a god pin. Mm -hmm. What you have is a, I'm trying to help everybody, and everybody's got their probably still their own a little bit of their own agenda because mm -hmm. I don't want to change this. We were really effective at this, or you know, this is what's made me successful for the last 25 this years. This is the way we do things. This is the way we do mm -hmm. things. So. It's not about just having uh, uh, soft skills. You have to be boots on the ground there. These these are not email conversations. Mm -hmm. These these have to be face to face conversations and and knowing how to navigate and weave your way through this kind of sticky web of not just always worry about saying the right thing, but dropping the things so that hopefully you don't have. There's no forcing of anything. There's mm -hmm. no awkwardness. It's like hey. I, I hear you. I hear where you're at. Let's think about it this way. These are the things the other people are working on. It's this constant um, shuffling of things on the board. Also, always remembering what's under what you know, which card is where mm -hmm. on the, on the playing table. That is a lot. That is a lot. At the same time, knowing that you have to continue to bring the underside and the underbelly of the business, which are the employees that are out there actually with the clients all the time, moving up, mm -hmm. right, and and constantly moving in the right direction. With, with regard to that, uh, as you, how do you implement training programs to standardize a process and then have quality results that you can measure and manage? 
where does that start when you've had these three different things happening for for so long and now you're trying to get it as fast as you can to under one umbrella? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's one that we're, we're still finding answers for. Um, we have really worked hard at developing this kind of, um, I'm going to say like a team of teams approach. Um, historically, we've relied on full-time instructors. Things where it's like, hey, these are our instructor cadre. There's eight of them or 12 of them, depending they're, on the time. They're employees. And they're employees. And gotcha. that's all they do is just instruction. Okay. Um, and that's easy because you can get everybody aligned. You can get every, like it's, that's their whole job. They devote, you know, however many 80 hours a week to it if, if needed, you know, like that's what they're doing is they're, they're, they're the subject matter experts and they're in charge. When you're bringing in all these different elements and then the way we're operating now is a very lightweight approach where it's, okay, we don't have one team. We have multiple teams. So who does what well? Um, who has what strengths? Who has what employees that we can pull in as not full-time instructors, but permanent instructors. So someone who's, you know, a TECC, a, a tactical emergency uh, casualty care um, t uh, instructor, which is that advanced medical, they're an instructor and an employee of a company. Okay, well, that's great. Like, so let's pull them in and let's have them do training for all of these companies. And let's bring in someone from company C who has, I'm using company, like not companies like military companies, gotcha. but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the three tiers. Like, yeah, like, right so right. let's pull in someone from company C who's a former pararescue and let's let's get him to teach as well. And so now we have two two people teaching, one certifying, one who's a subject matter expert. You know, uh, company B, hey, we, we really have um, a really good uh, licensing team. So our, like a, a team where, um, they do uh, all of the licensing for AHA medical, you know, um, like the the basic medical licensing, uh, BSIS training, like they're really locked on with that. Um, things like, that. okay, let, let's rely on them for all of your basic licensing. Let's rely on company C mm -hmm. who has, you know, maybe a guy who's a former um, secret service driver with, uh, you know, he drove four presidents or something like, okay, cool. He can help us design the training for, um, for that driving training. Not necessarily, yep. again, we talked about not ramming barricades, but what is actually security driving sure, about? Yeah. So let's, let's start pulling in all of these individuals and get it to be a one team approach. Kind of like a one team, one program is a, a kind of a buzzword that we're using nowadays uh, really recently. But how do we bring all these people in to focus as one team when they're coming from all these separate teams? And as you get people aligned and pointed similar directions, you start to all move in the same direction is what I've found. Um, and it is, it's a lot to keep track of. Um, it's something that I was not good at initially was kind of this political management. Mm -hmm. um, I was a guy who came in and if I thought something was right, I was going to fight for it. Um, and then it, it throughout my career and for, for varying degrees. And it was people like we talked, touched on as I grew people kind of showing me like, Hey, just because it's a fight doesn't mean it's the fight worth fighting. Right. Like sometimes, it's, yeah, yeah, sometimes it's fine just to like let things lie or, you know, a point of like, Hey, I wouldn't do it that way. But like, you know, yeah. is this really worth dying on? Like, yeah. And you know, oftentimes it'll on? work itself mm -hmm. out in the end anyway. Right. Yeah. And so it was really important as even, and that was even recent, um, you know, recent lessons that I learned in the last, you know, four years, even where it's like, what is important to me and what isn't, you know, what is something like there have been moments where it's like, yeah, this is, this is one that's important to me and, and we're going to fight this fight. And there's others where it's like, Hey, that's actually not how I would do something, but it's a valid way of doing it. So I'm fine embracing that way. You know, I'm going to let, I'm going to let the reins go. And that was a big one is how do we let the reins go and allow the entity, the organism as a whole succeed, even though I'm not in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that was kind of one of the final leadership lessons that I've learned recently is you don't have to be in the driver's seat in order to have a successful program and right. a, a successful team. So when we separated and from GDBA and we became this new company, initially we were looking at like, how do we do things the same way? I was like, I, I need a full-time instructor team. I need X amount of money. I need X amount of investment. We need this. And initially we were all, everyone was on board. Like, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to like, we're going to have this top tier, you know, program that is a schoolhouse and all these things. And then, you know, as things do, the, the, com the, the company direction shifts, you know, other things become important, other problems pop up and you sort of, the shakeout occurs where it's like, Hey, that's not as important anymore. And it was a hard lesson for me to learn of like, okay, we, it's time to pivot. I have to and, give this part up. Yeah. And so we finally had to pivot and it's not necessarily a worse way of doing things. It's just different of taking a lightweight approach. 
And the funny thing I learned is that you can actually get really good instruction from that lightweight approach where you're bringing in people who are full-time employees, but their whole job isn't training, Mm -hmm. but you're pulling them out of the field. So I got a guy coming in who's teaching, you know, field training, uh, like a basic field class to a a client's group, a client's team. And he just came out of the field on like a multi-country tour. And like that guy's like teaching things that he just learned. Right. You know, like he's, he's an expert of, you know, more than a decade but he's pulling in lessons that are, are brand new. You have guys who are like, hey, this is the newest stuff out in the field that we're seeing. Here's the newest threats. And they're bringing these things in. And so you have a constantly adapting program where maybe it's, you know, it's not as easy in terms of, hey, this is exactly how I want the program laid out and your lesson plans and the progression of the class. You know, that takes a little bit more handholding, but the content is far denser because you're getting people who are actively doing the job rather than just you know, full-time instructors. I think that's so important. And I, I learned that as well. Uh, and that there's a, there's, you mentioned the term cadre and that could probably be related to people that have been through maybe military and, and law enforcement or, you know, their first mm-hmm. responders, they may have heard this or even dealt with that before. I haven't, I'm not from that, that, uh, that era, but I was part of a cadre for, for a period of time as a, um, you know, working for a big corporation and one of the things that we really prided ourselves on was making sure we were out in the field with fingers on the pulse and hands on with the people that were making the biggest difference, that were the highest producers, were, which were the, those people that were the most educated, that were making the biggest impact on their on their in their gyms or in their region or whatever else, to understand what was working well, what were that we couldn't see, like from where we were. You show us and then prop them up, right, and then have them teach, you know, the others. Uh, same, like on the gym floor here, we have our, you know, we have a, we have a really solid team. Some people really nerd out on certain things and we give them leadership roles to, you know, teach a, teach a a staff development or something or whatnot. And always trying to be cognizant of what you learned five years ago has changed. Mm -hmm. And I think I hear a lot of frustration when I'm out like on the range or in the community training. And, you know, there's, there's a sort of a, a dichotomy of, there's some agencies, much like you're talking about now, that are constantly training, and they're doing it with uh, the new and the la- the newest and the latest stuff. And they send their instructors out constantly. Their their job is to go out to other places and bring back the knowledge and the new training and the practice and whatever else. And there are other agencies that have the same dude, the same armor, the same uh, guy, you know, that's in charge, who's been there for 25 years, and mm-hmm. they're turning over 25 year old you know, knowledge and information that really frustrates people for those that know. For those that don't know, they walk out of there and think, okay, well, I've been taught by a guy that's been doing this for 25 years. So mm-hmm. I should have like that experience alone. Like this is, I'm good. I'm good to go. And the reality of it is, is you're missing a lot there. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's a huge amount of value in that. Um, and going back to that, like, how do you get it all going? I mean, one of the thing, other things I learned was, and I had to learn this the hard way, much like you, 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 you mentioned, and that is, Hey, listen, your plans, they're going to change. Mm-hmm. So people ask me, like, I've had this this question several times, like, how important is a business plan? I think it's some fucking imperative. Mm-hmm. You have to have a business plan, but it's not, it doesn't mean that that's set in stone. And what you need to program into your business plan, and in this case, you know, your training plan, in my mind, is you need two things that are extraordinarily important. One is goals alignment. If everybody understands what the goal is, that that's very important because we can do things differently and still get to the same goal. That's the point we're trying to make. But as important or even maybe more important is the values alignment. And that's how we're going to do it. Not the exact training, but how are we going to respect one another? How are we going to stay open to these things? How are we going to be ready to the, you know, the changes that are inevitably inevitably going to happen and how do we work together? What's important for us along the way when we get hit in the side of the head with something, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And how are we going to, how are we going to hold one another accountable? Those are kind of the values piece within the goals. And so it's not about like, okay, it has to be this way and it's a straight line every time. There's 100% not going to be a straight line ever in any of this. Uh, but it doesn't mean you still can't have the same goal and still be measuring the same outcomes. You just need to maybe measure things a little bit differently. What's the trajectory? Are we getting to that number, that thing, whatever? And uh, how fast, you know, is, is the velocity moving at the lo- at the level it needs to or at the speed it needs to? Because then we can twist dials and toggle switches if necessary right. within the teams. And that means like, 
hey, this isn't moving as fast. Maybe we don't have the right instructor Mm -hmm. or maybe we're not giving that instructor the right support. Uh, And, you know, maybe we need to go outside to a third party to help us maybe figure this aspect out. Are you guys at that point yet? Or is it like, it's like, hey, we're just moving forward kind of as fast, but as cautiously as we can. and, And we're looking at that, like, as that might be a thing. But right now we feel like we can handle it all in house. No, I mean, that that's huge what we're looking at. And we actually are um, almost the opposite. Like we, right now, what we're coming out of is we're looking at what is our over, what's our goal that we want to get to in terms of training? And, you know, how, how do we want training to occur in an ideal world? And with the caveat of, okay, let, let's move there. Let's get that direction. Um, but how do we still fulfill training currently? Because unlike probably some industries, you, you don't have a lot of time of, of dead time. So we have to deliver at the same time that we're working towards right. the the end delivery goal. And so it's a lot of how do we fulfill the current mission, which is we have people who are in the field right now. We're always using the analogy, like we're flying the plane while we're building it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're three established companies who are doing the work that we've always done with clients that we've always done, new clients, and we can't have standards slip. We can't have quality fall. Um, so how do we maintain that and grow? Because if you're not, if you're not growing, you're stagnating. If you're not, and if you're stagnating, you're failing, you're getting worse. There's no such thing as, as just plateauing. Uh, I don't know if it's the same in fitness. You you don't just plateau and stay at a level. It's either you're rising or you're falling. Yeah. Or there's, there's the thing that's actually eroding your business, which is creating the plateau. So if in fact, whether you realize it or not, it, the plateau is a symptom exactly of a failure exactly and and so with us too it's looking at like okay here's where we're going which our goal long term is and it's current as well as basic and intermediate we're providing so everything in house is basic and intermediate level um, and intermediate obviously the the scale will change you know it will rise as the instructor um, the instructor ability and the the student ability rises as well. Okay. So that's a, a sliding scale in my mind. But advanced, when we get starting really specialized, that's where we're going to third party. So things like, um, you know, advanced driving training. I'm not the guy who's going to teach you how to drive an armored car. That's smart. Like, that's yeah. we're gonna we're gonna go to someone whose whole job it is. Like I spoke earlier about how we're uh, a part of Garda Federal or yeah. Garda Worldwide. Oh, mm-hmm. Uh, we're an arm of that. And an arm of that also is Garda Federal. And Garda Federal is like one of the premier overseas PSD high threat uh, uh, providers of um, protection in, in the world. They're, they've got some of the, the largest contracts out there. Um, and with that comes things like armored car driving, gunfighting, um, you know, these high threat kind of skills. And so part of our goal is we, we want to build that partnership interfamily, like two yep. separate business units, but interfamily but also because they get a lot of reps on it. Like they got, they got guys in, you know, Af- they had guys in Afghanistan with that contract, uh, Iraq, Ukraine, Africa. Like they have people all over the world who are currently doing it. So they're really having to train those guys to high standards. Well, we can use that for our, our specialized training. Same thing with, you know, companies like AS3 uh, driving training, VDI driving training, um, our Curie group, who's doing a lot of the situational learning stuff, like people who are really specialized, they're going to do that one thing really, really well. So we want to tap into that for our more specialized training. But to get there, you know, TCCC, we, we, we just kind of, that, that sliding scale of intermediate has just now encompassed TECC training because we have in-house instructors who are currently qualified to do that. Okay. So that's something that we can start providing as we build that program out. But you know, I, I want to go and, and utilize people who that's their whole, they're going to provide a really good product for that, but I got to get someone to that level first. You know, I need them to be able to understand one, a basic assessment, basic wound packing, basic trauma care before they're going in and they're learning about mass casualty incidents and things like that. Right. So how do we grow those skills internally first and then get to advanced training? And that's our goal is that kind of tiered approach where it's it's learning all these different skill sets. People bounce around almost like a video game Mm-hmm. you know, or like collegiate mm-hmm. level learning. But currently we can't let that slip because we have, again, like I referenced people in the field doing it. So we have to provide training currently while we're building. So we have instructors who are doing concurrently two different things, building for the future and, and then doing going it. out and doing it. At the same time, they're also in the field providing it, which touches on a point that I want to go back to that you, you spoke on earlier, which is that going out and actually doing, you know, you're, you've got your finger on the pulse. I, I, I really hate the the phrase like those who can't do teach mm. because in my opinion those who can't do 
who are teaching shouldn't be teaching. Mm -hmm. Like you are now out of touch and you are not good enough to be teaching that, that product. There's a difference between someone who's really qualified, who's just not able to teach well. That's different. But someone who can't do what they're supposed to do shouldn't be teaching. I it. agree with you. So that's, I'm, I love the fact that like in firearms, the big demo, everything is coming back. You know, guys like Jason with, uh, who's like uh, 10 zero concepts, um, uh, CTT solutions with Mike, Mike Pano. And like yep. everything you do, you have to show your students first because no one buys into it if you can't do it. The same thing, we had an instructor um, who's a, a good friend of mine, Matt Govea, who, uh, uh, big, awesome background. He now, I think he works at Nike, like runs their EP program. But he, uh, in addition to being a full-time instructor, so his whole job was being an instructor, he worked like 80 to 100 days in the field per year, constantly traveling. Like he would get off of our, our entry-level academy and he would go travel with clients and he would pick up details all the time. And he would be constantly asking people like, hey, what's going on? What worked here? What didn't work here? And I really respected the fact that he was constantly pushing himself because he didn't want to be the guy just teaching. He wanted to be the guy teaching things that were current. So that's, again, what we're looking at is how do we keep people current who are teaching and they're able to do and teach, but they're also good instructors. And that's kind of where we're at now is, all right, we got to pull these people in. How do we also teach them how to teach? Scaling a business is hard. Mm -hmm. And, and um, what I, it's, it's not easy. And, and there's, there's a framework I think that you, you have to work within and you're doing a really good job of articulating it for the most successful businesses I've seen, particularly when it comes to handling many employees that need a high level of training. It, again, you use like the coder who comes in as an engineer. When they come in, they don't need a lot of training. They need to know where the coffee machine is, right? They need to know where the bathrooms are. And then they get the project sitting in front of them. And, and that's just the way I'm going to put it out there. I mean, if I'm offending any coders out there, I... I I'm sure it's different. It's whatever. Yeah. It's whatever. But my, my point of this is, is you sit down and you code and you figure out the pro problems. There's not a lot of training that comes. There's certainly not a lot of soft skill that comes with that. I know that for a fact, mm -hmm. you know, there's, you have to worry about, okay, you don't want to piss off your bosses in the office, you know, you know, three doors down, but you're not even in that office anymore. You get to sit at home and do these things. We don't, we don't right. really go to an office. So there's all of that versus what you're doing. Um, I've likened it to the fitness industry, which is similar, but there's probably a lot of other ones out there and scaling up and learning. And I see a lot of my friends doing this. I see a lot of people in sort of the world of preparedness, uh, firearms instruction, medical instruction, uh, self-defense instruction, those kinds of th things, like whether it's jujitsu to, you know, covering all, trying to cover it all. And that is get growing because you most people... Uh, in the industry that have been successful to this point, again, those are the the Instagram personalities that you see out there. They got that because they did the the business and they're still doing the business. And now they're doing it and trying to run and grow a business. And at some point, those lines are going to intersect where you have to decide, like I, you're trading time for dollars as an instructor, mm -hmm. right? Like it's just like being a personal trainer. It, eventually, you're going to run out of time. Right? right. And there's a couple different ways you can make adjustments there. You can charge more dollars, but you still have to put in the same amount of time. And eventually you're going to want to do more so that at some point things have to change and you have to have a framework for delivering this information. Uh, if you want to, to, sorry, to the new incoming employee or the assistant instructor or whatever, because doing the business and running a business are two entirely different things. But it is important that you do stay doing the business at some level and how you do that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the person that does maybe 25% of the year would get out into the field. I, I don't want to speak out of turn here, but the way I understand like some of the teams at the military level, that's how they operate too. They go out, they do a deployment, they're out there uh, for, for a period of time. And then they have to, they pull them out and they pull them, when they pull them out, they put them in one place they instruct or they go to a different school to learn something new. Then they go train some more with these new skills and then they get deployed again. They go out there and then they bring all that knowledge and whatnot back. That kind of a framework is effectively what I hear you kind of laying down right now. Um, and so uh, again, with the scaling, scaling up of the business, I imagine there has to be a lot of exploration into what are the technologies we need to use in order to do this? What is mm -hmm. the best way in today's space and today's landscape to deliver this information to keep the needle moving forward while they're still doing the business in the field? What might some of those things be? Like, what? how are you holding people accountable, giving them good information, 
doing the check-ins to be able to manage, you know, the expectations, what, what's going on there? Because that, that takes an incredible amount of manpower if you're doing the business mm -hmm. uh, rather than developing the ways to continue to grow the business. Well, and, and you touched on, before we kind of get into the innovations that we're looking at, which, which are huge, and I think they're going to be, you know, really groundbreaking, but um, you, you touched on the balance of, you've got people doing the job and trying to build the business and trying to build the instructor job at the same time. And it's a balance that we have to strike with this sort of uh, permanent, not full-time instructor, but a permanent, someone who's, whose job it is to teach one thing, but also they're, they're they do other in the things. field. They do the other things. Yep. Is you, that is only a benefit for so long until you have that kind of the fragility where it tips. There's and, a crossover. Right. Yep. And so that's part of what we're looking at is how do we manage people's time where they are giving you know, so much to their current client and we're not taking that away because again, at the end of the day, that's, that's the priority is, is client safety and their safety. So we can't take away from that. So we're, we're going to add another piece on top, which is building instruction, which a lot of people are, are their self-starters and they want to do that, but how do we manage it where it doesn't all of a sudden become their whole job and it's taking away from their current job or both, both are, are, are burdened, are, some yeah, burdened or, or yeah. not, we're not delivering at the caliber we need to. So that's something that we're looking at is with a full-time instructor, that doesn't matter because that's their whole job and that's their whole delivery is that that's what they're, they're focused on. But again, you're, you have to worry about that information stagnation, but with a, a part-time or a permanent instructor, you're looking at, you're getting top line information straight out of the field, but they're still doing the job. So we have to be able to balance that in, in the appropriate way. So that's something that we're exploring and a way that we've kind of pivoted, and it's actually interesting that that uh, COVID helped us in this in this manner, um, which is I know like everyone's like oh my god, no, same for me. COVID man. actually helped, but yeah, help, help me. It helped sure. us adjust our viewpoint on things like e learning, uh, yeah. and e learning and virtual learning. So to me, those are two separate things. Um, it used to be that we would focus on training as hey, it's PowerPoint driven. You have someone with a PowerPoint as a learning aid, and they're in front of a class teaching, and then we go out and we do it. Um, and then if we did e-learning, it was, Hey, here's the PowerPoint with like a recording of a voice. And it was, it was okay. You know, it was fine. We, we were for some people, for, some for others, people. it could be death by PowerPoint. What yeah. ended up happening is you would be sitting at, you know, your, your residence that you're, you're at or in a car and you'd be required to watch this thing and you hit play and then you just let it go yeah. and you don't pay attention. Yeah. So the, for the, me, the, the state requires us to do this HR training that we have to do every right. year. And, the, that's and what all does everyone doing. do? Hit play? They're just putting it up there in the front desk. And quite frankly, it's not important to me. So I just let them do that. That's right. fine, right? But mm -hmm. it's a requirement. It's not my requirement. I would have never put that together that way in that, in that format for that exact reason. But it is what it is. So. Exactly. And it's the same thing. So initially, that's what we were looking at. Because e-learning was, was, was getting bigger, but it wasn't a big thing. And then COVID hit. And of course, everything became virtual for at least six to eight months, it was no in-person anything. So you had things like Zoom, Teams, um, all of these like, you know, virtual meeting, Google Meet, all of these virtual meeting platforms all of a sudden started getting huge investments, becoming robust, and people's usage of them became the norm. So instead of, hey, we're going to have a meeting, let's meet at a coffee shop, it became, oh, let's just have a Teams meeting. Let's jump on and do that. So I really looked at it with how do we capitalize on this? And about that time, we we had joined with the larger Garda World family who are also looking at how do we really grow our Garda University or, or what they called campus at the time, but all of the, the online learning because it had been the same. It had been PDFs that were just mm -hmm. online, read it, do a quick quiz, you're done. Versus how do we actually impart knowledge? How does people grow? So what we, we had looked at is, okay, we got a new learning management system. Uh, we use Absorb or something, you know, it's been around a while, but it's really robust. How do we put good learnings on there that are going to one, engage people, but two, impart knowledge. So get them to not just hit play. So how do I force them to actually read the information and participate in the information? Is it force or is it like, how do you get them to like want to engage with uh, it? This is the, this is the challenge, right? This is the challenge, but it's also the unpopular opinion. I have to force people sometimes. Yeah. Like my job There's is- got to be a, you must. Hey, at some point it's like, this isn't just a hit play and let it go for two hours. Like you're going to have to keep scrolling, at least click on the different links, hit the video, take the quiz and then move on. Or you'll never get to, or move you'll on. never get to move on. And so part of it is me forcing, but then now that I've forced you, how do I make it worth your time? Because the last thing I need is people going, this isn't worth my time. Mm -hmm. You forced me to do this, but it's not worth my time. So how do I capitalize on the investment I'm forcing you to make to be a positive one? 
And that's been the the difficulty. I'll be honest, e-learning was not my specialty. I'm creative, but I'm not like a content creator. So it was a lot of learning and talking to people like uh, Colette Gaines, who's Garda World's like director of education. And, and that's what she does is e-learning. Talking to her and saying like, hey, what is it we're looking for? And her explaining the things I just explained of, well, you shouldn't have all text. You should have text broken up with an interactive picture, with a video. Like le- it was learning a whole new style of teaching because that's now under my purview. So how do I, it, it, it's not an option for me to say, hey, I, it's not my thing. We're not going to do it. That's not, that, that's a fail. Like I need to be able to deliver on this right. because it's something that will, will benefit people. So let me learn it and now figure out how to deliver it. Um, and so that was a big push is that e-learning, which is a content that is made to be delivered in an e-format, which to me, the natural transition is hybrid. So a lot of times we hear this death by PowerPoint. You go to a course and everyone hates it, especially in our industry uh, and even probably fitness as well. Sure. So you go and you're like, I'm a fitness guy. I'm going to go learn how to, you go to a coach's seminar or something. And I, I've had this in jujitsu where I sit on the mat and I like, I listen for two hours and I'm like, I'm, I haven't done any rolling yet or right. any skills. Like mm-hmm. I just am sitting here listening to you talk. That's not what I'm here for. But it's necessary because, and sometimes I have to deliver knowledge to you before you can actually start participating. It just, it, this makes perfect sense to me. And I understand why I'm sitting there, but I still don't like right. it. Yeah. So how do I, how can I capitalize on the time of e-learning and that platform to deliver knowledge that you're going to need? But that means that the two days of in-person we're doing. You mm-hmm. show up, you've already learned the content. Now let's start doing it. I don't have to teach you where, you know, the, the brachial artery is or anatomy or anything like that. While you're in a TECC class, you've learned that already. Go right to it. Let's go right to tourniquets, wound packing, you know, uh, uh, sealing the box, things like that. Like, let's learn, let's do reps. Let's not spend time on death by PowerPoint. So this is where I see a lot of the newer instructors, particularly in this fast growing world and specifically of firearms uh, training, which is obviously very, it's unregulated. Like mm-hmm. anybody can say they're a firearms instructor. Anybody can say they have a resume, get whatever certs or not, whatever. It's the same as personal training if mm-hmm. you want to look at it that way. But what I see them doing is really being challenged by this whole concept. Like I have this group full of people and I don't want to have them sitting around too long, right? I have to get them shooting right away. That goes with any, you have to get that engagement happening. And I came out here to learn about firearms. Like part of firearms training should be about shooting, right. shooting the firearm. Most right? of it should be. Most be, right. right? Most of it, right? We can talk about it all day long, but I got to get you mm-hmm. doing stuff. But what they, what I see them being, being challenged by is doing that and keeping people engaged and then getting them back to do more. And if I, if I'm not constantly showing them something fancy and moving it at a, at a fast pace, then I lose people, right? And like a percentage of those people begins to get larger the longer we go, right? With more, more training sessions or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, there's like this, they want to accelerate things really, really quickly. I've seen some firearms instructors be very successful at putting together some e-learning programs, which do a couple of things. First, it gives somebody sort of a lower price point to get into your training and kind of see what you're all about. It mm-hmm. talks about some things. Hey, before you come to the level one training, make this investment for, I don't know, $150, $300, whatever it is. Make this investment for 10 or 20 bucks and watch my online e-learning thing, whatever it happens to be on whatever platform they've, mm-hmm. they've put it on. And you're going to learn a bunch of stuff that that way when we get there and I am moving through it faster, right? Because they're still trying to stay balanced. I'm moving what would have been very fast had you never heard this stuff before. You're It's being re-taught to you versus not being told to you for the first time. There is, and again, like... We could, I could go on and on and on about this, but I've learned that too. And that was one of the things that COVID really did for me as well is, well, now I've got to expand my reach. I have to expand the, the, the lessons. And I also recognize that it takes time that people don't have the patience for to get their investment back. Like, here's an example. Like if, if you wanted to try or get started with like a nutrition coach, right? Or it's the same with firearms instruction as far mm-hmm. as I'm concerned, or even medical, like there's a certain foundation of stuff you have to know. You were just telling me, like, I have to teach you the stuff on the jujitsu mat. Like, you have to learn about this before we can actually apply it. Or you won't understand what I'm saying. Oh, you'll be doing, and you'll be feeling through it, and it makes it might make some sense. But the value is not there because there was no context to it prior. And for those people that learn differently than maybe the other person, they're not picking that up. So they need a way to do do this. But 
like the first month of any training program, like if you're learning a new skill and going back to what you said, people learn in different ways. Uh, that first month is a lot of basically the same stuff. It's the same information. People just onboarding it maybe in a different way. Mm -hmm. People accelerating or or not moving through as fast based on their previous experience, their history, their learning style, whatever it happens to be. So we did the same. We started to put some stuff you know, into like an online learning platform for those people that wanted to learn that way and maybe even make a smaller investment of time to kind of tease them into, okay, to your point, this is worth my time. Mm -hmm. This is worth my time because then I went and I gained so much more from the time, the larger investment of time that I put in. You just got to get them to come to the table with it. And this is the thing that I found the toughest. With the world today with social media and 15 or 30 second you know, people trying to educate people on Instagram and Facebook. Attention and span. And the attention span is so small, so, so small. short. Uh, I mean, there's really, all you're really doing there in my mind is kind of teasing them to want to maybe learn more and then maybe mm -hmm. spend 60 seconds instead of 30 seconds listening to your stuff. And and by the way, the, the platforms are set up that way to, you know, to do that. Like, you know, they'll... Instagram will drive the algorithm for the person that's staying on for 30 versus 29 seconds. Right. Right. And, and so, and that, that can talk, that continually changes. So for somebody that's trying to teach uh, or grow a business where teaching learning is part of it, and you're trying to gain a fee for service. And that is the, the, the teaching. This is a very tough place to be right now with attention spans, all the things that are out there, all the noise. Um, and the, the, again, the different, uh, places people are coming into that process. I imagine for you, it's just a constant, constant reevaluation is what is what we're doing being effective or not. And how long do we keep doing it this way to really be able to measure that before we maybe make a change? Right. And, and that's the big thing too, is, is your return on investment. And with us, I think the, the difficulty and the difference is we're training in, internal employees. So it's a lot of how do we, how do we measure that that buy-in, so to speak, like with an external business where you're trying to bring clients on, you can see, well, we had X number of renewals this month. We had new clients mm -hmm. signing up. We had this metrics. much expansion. Yeah, yeah. Metrics. What metrics can we get from our current employees that aren't, because they're not investing money, they're investing time, but there's also an element of they're required to invest time. So how can we measure our delivery of training. And that's, you know, checks on learning, uh, the ability of people in classes, um, for us, an easy one. So I touched on earlier e-learning and then virtual learning. So we've done, um, several sessions of, uh, like virtual seminars. So it'd be the same as you going like almost like continuing education, you going to a class, sitting in on a virtual seminar for four hours or something, and then you leave and you're done you get so many credits. What we've done is is virtual learning based on events. So someone, you know, we had the uh, the shooting on the New York subway, mm -hmm. um, and we did a an e learning. So we called it a virtual seminar where one of our internal subject matter experts, who was former NYPD for a long time, um, broke down the incident, the response, um, some actions you can take yourself, and we did two one hour segments. So. Very quick, someone can log in from the car while they're sitting, you know, out front of a client's house. It's not a huge time commitment. Um, and so how can we, and it's live, you know, it's a, it's a PowerPoint. It's someone sitting on teams doing it live. How many, and, and our metric was how many people logged in? How many people stayed? How many people asked questions? Were we able to draw? Were we, were we having to say like, come on guys, like answer, like I asked you a question, what do you think? Right. Or was it, hey, people are just, you know, pushing like, Hey, this is what I think. Well, here's right. this discussion. And it's always hard because it's easy just to log in and just listen. You don't want to participate, but if it's something that's really engaging to them or an instructor, that's really engaging. You get a lot of questions, a lot of feedback. Qualitative feedback. And yeah. so it's some of it's ob objective, like how many people logged in? We only got, you know, 15 people for this, you know, whatever, a medical basic medical assessment one, but the New York, uh, active shooter incident took 150 like, people. Yeah, yeah, we, we got 50 and we had a wait list, you know, right. But then also it's it's subjective in that, well, the basic medical, we had more actually engagement so uh, than the, the New York uh, yeah. shooting. So it's, okay, what is that? Was it an instructor? Was it the, the content that we had? Do we need to capitalize more on video to keep people engaged? Or is it, you know, do we need to reevaluate the way we set up the classes? How much time is devoted to background? How much time is devoted to this? What really engaged people? So it's looking at, 
what are our metrics that we can find that aren't just like, did someone pass or fail? Um, and that's been a, a, again, kind of a learning point is, okay, now that we have to prove training, because again, it's a, it's a new thing. So we're constantly trying to grow and get more resources and, and say, okay, do we want to focus more on def- defensive tactics or do we want to focus more on firearms or this? Like what's, what's going to be the best return on investment in terms of people's time and, and the, the, you know, delivery, the, the importance of the content how do we measure which route we should start investing in? You know, what do people want to learn first, but also how much does it cost versus everyone wants to go to do more firearms training. But ever since post COVID, those tiny little rounds cost a lot of money. And every time, now that I'm on a range, every time a gun goes bang, all I hear is cha-ching. Right, and it's yeah. just my, my budget getting smaller and smaller. Yep. That's, versus, all, that's a tough place. It's a reality, right? right? Right. Versus defensive tactics, like the mats, the instructor time, the people's time, like that's all, of course, money, but it's not, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's fixed. It's, yeah. And it's passive. So, okay. That's a good return on investment. And people are interested in that versus firearms. Yeah. We get a big output, but like, we don't, we're not involved in a lot of shootings. So do we need to, like, Truth. what's, what's the level of, of engagement versus need that we need to, we need to push with here. I really hope that people that are, that have their own business, particularly in that where they deal with clients, where they're teaching them a skill or giving them trying to provide value through instruction are listening to this because if you're not, like what ends up happening is, is you, you mentioned reaching that curve where you're tipping over to the other side and you're spending more time doing than you should be uh, driving and innovating and uh, developing your business. And I'm, I'm starting to see that and people are reaching. The other part of it is, is in that driving, developing your business, it's finding these tools and what is important in terms of the engagement and, and how do I make this more efficient? How do I keep people engaged? Uh, in the classes that I'm taking or the the session that I'm teaching or this particular thing? And how might I uh, uh, maybe kind of force multiply the things that I'm doing out here, whether that's with somebody else, some other, you know, team, or do I need to get more, um, do I need to get more diversified? Do I need to be less diversified? Do I have, uh, and if I, if I have the skill and the ability to be more diversified, where do I put my efforts and, and how could I put my efforts placed differently? Like maybe I have this little e-learning program on there. Maybe I, I you know, I spend more t- and, and I only do these two classes, these two very specific classes. And this one comes in on occasion. I it's, it is very, very tough. And I, I wanted to have you on to really, to, to kind of outline the things that you're going from a corporate level where you have a large amount of resource, right? So to speak, mm-hmm. I mean, relative to the, the smaller business owner, maybe, uh, or the people, the person that's in the field that doesn't really understand what they see their company or their fellow instructors doing or whatever else, and they may not have may not have picked up on this. A, a, a high amount of resources, You've got lots of talent, and a lot of skill around you. Um, the ability to 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 go out and try new things and be supported in doing that um, by a corporation and a big people, and you're challenged. Mm-hmm. You're having a you're having a tough time, and there isn't like one way to do it. Uh, but at the same time. You've been very successful at, at a lot of levels. So I wonder if maybe just kind of shifting the conversation a little bit, one of the things I see happening in, in the industry is the is the privatization of this EP thing, particularly mm-hmm. like with the contractor. Mm-hmm. And you just mentioned a lot of things like, here's all the learning I have to get or I should be getting while I'm also on the job working for a client. Maybe I've had some success and I've been able to bring on a couple of other people, Mm -hmm. right. That are now subcontracting for me and in the, in the field. I wonder what kind of your, your, your take is on what's going on in the, I'll just say the private contractor field versus the, the corporate end of the, of the EP business right now. And kind of what's the outlook, like what's the, um, what's the state of the union, if you will. (laughs) I'm I'm definitely, you know, like I'll, I'll get political with it, but no, um, it's, it is very interesting because you have, I think because it is becoming more of a, a um, larger modern industry where there's a lot more interest in it, a lot more um, uh, request, a lot of, of varying natures. It's not just, you know, the Kevin Costner, Whitney Houston kind of dynamic where it's one person, one protectee, um, sort of the way you forgot to, about that movie. bodyguard. Yeah. It's a classic. Every EP guy should watch it and not do some of the things yeah, that he right. does in there. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's no longer just that there are people out there who are very successful as I am one guy, I get on contract with one person, maybe two or three, 
And I just bounce around from there and I, I develop contacts. It's v- they're very successful, but it's also a lot of work. Um, and it's also just very individual driven and unregulated. You know, it's based on, can you sell yourself? Can you do the job? Um, and, but it's not something where there's a lot of standardization. You know, one person's going to do something very different than another person. Um, and I think what you're seeing a lot of is, you know, with bigger companies, like ours is obviously a bigger company. People probably hate us, you know, we're the big, bad, evil giant. Um, and, and companies can tend to be that, but you also from that get a lot of standardization. You get a lot of quality and checks because corporations are worried about themselves. Yeah. They got their ass to protect. Right. And so with that, like there's a lot of conversations I have with legal or a lot of things where I sit there and I have to think now, which has been another learning point of me is not just, Hey, do I want to do this training? Like, yeah, I want to, I want to learn how to shoot out of a moving car. Like, that's really cool. But now that I'm the one saying like, let's go do that. I now think like, Oh my gosh, like what happens if someone gets shot on the range? Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to have to sit on a, 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 you know, in a courtroom and, mm-hmm. and justify the decision of, of were the instructors prepared? Did we do our risk mitigation properly? Did we have insurance properly? So I have to really structure that training with that in mind. Same thing with a decision on like, you know, I helped write our, uh, our firearms policy as a company. Okay. Like I looked at it not as what do I want to carry because I enjoy firearms. I'm very passionate about it. I'm very knowledgeable. I would say objectively on, on a lot of the nuances of mm-hmm. different technology and new stuff coming out. You know, I've used a lot of triggers. I've used a lot of, you know, um, uh, connectors that are these, you know, the one and a half pound triggers versus five and a half duty pound triggers. But I had looked, had to look at it as, are we going to be able to justify this if it's ever used? And someone goes deep into it in court. And so the same thing is like, it, it provides a level of standardization in the company, which I think is necessary. It's a check and a balance. And I think you're seeing that a little bit with the, the EP industry as well, with um, some of these companies like ESI, Covered Six, um, Pacific West Academy, La Sorsa, these companies that are driving training and driving standards as people pay to go to them. It's now there's an expectation of these are the things you should know. These are the things that, that a good executive protection agent or protector should know and should be able to deliver on things like behavioral awareness training situational awareness and uh, red zones, your surveillance detection, um, firearms, of course, defensive tactics, but everything beyond just like, yeah, I was a former this, that, and the other, or, you know, I, I look and I fill the part. It's, can you avoid the problem ahead of time? And even now you're seeing like smaller companies like Byron Rogers coming in and filling voids of, now they're starting to become a little bit more standardization but you're starting to see, again, these different, in my opinion, different areas and, and edges where people are taking, hey, this is my specialty. Yep. This is what I think we should do. This is what I think we should do. And with the larger, I think, investment in terms of bigger companies like, you know, your Silicon Valleys, your um, uh, studios, um, not just an individual person. You mean like movie studios? Movie or? studios, yeah, gotcha. uh, music studios too, like so you're talent refer- agencies. Yeah, you're referring to like the, the larger amount of the higher dollar clients, not the, which is a large piece of the pie. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of pie out there. Right. There's a large piece of the pie. And so we, I think where I hear you going is like, if you're intent on getting into this, then there's going to be some standardization that's going to have to be there. Right. And there's an expectation there will be an expectation. You may be able to get in into the industry and that's a lot of times you can get into the industry, but eventually you're going to get asked like, Hey, what, what are your qualifications on this? You're going to be involved in an incident maybe where you handle it and you maybe handle it entirely correctly that everybody else was like, Hey, that was, that was perfect. But somebody in that bigger entity, this bigger corporation in a legal department or something, or an attorney attorney is going to look at it and say like, Hey, are you trained in defensive tactics? Like, have you gone through de-escalation training? And so that's where, if you're looking to get into this as a, as a contractor, you know, a contract worker, who's just one guy or maybe a couple of guys, you need to start looking at that as how can I fill those gaps? And I'm not advocating for being part of a larger company at all. Um, I think there are pros and cons to it, but a big pro is those standardizations, a lot of times those companies already have to provide it because to get these bigger contracts, we're having to go through and prove like, yeah, we provide all of this and here's all our examples. You know, we're citing our sources. And part of that is, is you, you get to make mistakes on the company's dime, mm-hmm. right? And and they're going to be training you on their dime. You're right. getting paid. You're actually, it's as much like going to become a coach at a, you know, at a big corporate, corporate type fitness gym mm-hmm. or whatever. Like they, 
there's that could suck for a while. Like, but and that's part of it. You know, you might hate it. But at the same time, there's a lot of opportunity buried within there if you feel like it's the right environment for you. But to your point, like they're handling the liability, right? And they've, they're, again, there's checks and balances there. And I think what I kind of hear you saying is the industry as a whole is it's becoming innovative or it's being innovated and it's moving forward and it's becoming so much bigger. And these corporations are starting to, uh, you know, contract with other bigger corporations for EP and, and so forth that the industry itself of EP is starting to police itself. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, absolutely within, within it, like not, um, there's not a regulating body. The, the regulators are really the, the industry itself and it's their expectation is growing. I mean, I saw that in the gym business, mm -hmm. uh, you know, huge, like anybody could say they're a coach and they can still do that same with EP, mm -hmm. right? Uh, anybody can say that, but after a while, like you're only going to get so far on what you say, and other people need to say it about you too. And they need to be able to back you. They need to be able to back it up. And at some point you get to a point where you're offered a position working for like the big company, somebody else there is actually making that decision, not the dude you talk to or the actor. Right. Right. The actor might really like you, mm -hmm. right. Or the executive for Facebook. And that does go far. May, they might really mm -hmm. like you and they can get your foot in the door. But at some point there's going to be a leadership team, a legal team, you know, somebody's got to vet this whole thing out. Like, all right, well, you know, Vice President X really likes this dude. So we have to take a look at him. And then they're going to advise, you know, you may still get in, mm -hmm. but, or maybe you don't. Maybe that that the legal team finally goes to, you know, the the, the Vice President X and says, hey, listen, man, uh, we, we know you like this guy, but we don't recommend bringing him on. And here are all the reasons why. Mm -hmm. uh, you We might not be the decision maker here, but we're advising you no. Right. Um, for, the, for that matter. And so, and, and those, the interesting thing is they're, they're smart guys and, and gals, like these people who, who are maybe like, Hey, I really like Scott, like the decision maker, yeah, the, deci the decision maker. So if someone, an entity that they have trusted with legal or, or quality assurance in their company says, look, this isn't a good choice. Odds are they're going to listen to them and they're going to say like, Hey, okay, move on. You know, it's not, this is, we're kind of getting out of the good old boy system now when you're talking about bigger contracts. Again, if you're just going one-on-one -on -one with one guy and it's kind of a buddy-buddy system, you can get away with a lot. But even so, like you may go to events where you're required to show certain credentials. And if you don't have those or certain training, you're not going, like you, you can't get in. Is it getting to be more like that? Like uh, than it may have been in the past? It is. And I think it's because we touched on it earlier. You have more practitioners that are entering this upper sphere or going internal with companies or events, you know, like the Oscars, um, red carpet premieres. Like you have people that were on the ground and saw, you know, the less than ideal protector or someone who was cutting corners also working alongside you. And now they're in a decision-making capability and they're saying, uh, -uh like I Can't want, I want this category of person, whether it's a company or a, mm. a practitioner. And, you know, you, you are, you're starting to see that where it's, um, we, you talked about it, there's no regulating body and there really isn't. Um, there's certain states that have certain credentials that mm. more apply. Like Texas has a level system, level one, two, three, four, and three and four are really your executive protection. It's almost like you're a, a peace officer, like a reserve peace officer, but it's kind of geared towards executive protection. But like California doesn't. Like in California, the only licenses you're required to have by the state are a security guard license which is the same license that, you know, someone standing outside a bank has to have. Um, and so there's no overall regulation, but internally, again, you're starting to see a lot more of that. And it's, it's still a very small, while it's, it's a growing and probably one of the biggest growing industries out there is security. It's still small enough where if I don't know you, I know someone who does yeah, know you. Yeah. Um, and it, it does get around. It's like, oh, you know, so-and-so brought, you know, Scott to, to, protect them on this detail. And it's like, oh, Scott doesn't have any of his licenses. And it's just like, don't trust that guy. You know? I wonder, like, that's actually a good point. Like, do you see a lot of people jumping ship to go to the different companies and do the different things? I mean, is it incestuous like it that? Is. It's, yeah. it's definitely an incestuous. And incestuous is, uh, I guess, a bad term, you know, because it's, it's, I get it. it's negative, a negative connotation. Negative connotation. It's, we actually see it in, in a good way sometimes, you know, because you do have people who are leaving a company and it's not always bad. It's not always, hey, I, I'm leaving because this company is is a bad company. It, it is in definitely some some cases, but sometimes it's just, hey, I, I want to be doing this job instead. And there's no there's opportunity. opportunity. Yeah, there's opportunity where you're going. Yeah. But you now have someone who's familiar with another operation. And so what we've seen, and that's part of what eased the transition into this crisis 24, you know, powerhouse 
is there was enough bleed over between companies where like, I've worked with a lot of the people at these other companies, now my company before, you know, that we started together and they've gone over and now they've come back mm -hmm. and it's, it's easy. You know, it's, it's become less of a competition before it was very like, Oh, well, this is who we are and everyone else sucks. And it was before, you know, Oh, well, this is where we are. And these people suck. Oh, that's very natural. Right. Yeah. But now it's, it's getting a lot better. And I think it's because there's so much movement. It's less of, you know, Oh, well, those are crisis 24 guys. You know, they're not good. It's, it's, Hey, like we just worked together two weeks ago, you know, or like we're on the same detail again, saying, you know, different clients, but we're, we're working together again. And Hey, we might as well work as one team. Cause even though we're separate companies, separate clients, our overall goal is protection. So if I'm working with you and like, hey, both our clients are on the stage at the same time, you just cover stage right, I'll cover stage left. And then we'll work together even though we're separate companies. You know, you're seeing a lot more of that of pe people being okay with it and trusting people because again, you're starting to see that standardization where there's, there's a minimum level of learning or qualification beyond just, I have the minimum, I went to my guard card class and I'm good. Mm. As, uh, this That's fascinating to me. I, I just want to kind of, bring up maybe be the devil's advocate here going back to like, you're seeing that. And mm -hmm. the, I've used, I use the term incestuous, but it's really more of like an, inter, you said more of like an integration and kind of a crossover and overlap. You said something earlier and that is like the old boys club, right? Mm -hmm. um, doesn't that kind of encourage the old boys club? It does. It, I, I would say it does. And initially, and this is one thing that has kind of been a growing point for me again, over, over my years is, you always, when you're not part of the boys club, you just hate the boys club, but the boys club is everywhere. And so it's hard of, you know, people. And I've realized now it's people want to work with people that they like. And so you just, it's, it's navigating those political waters. Um, and, and I think it is kind of, you know, you have to be careful of the boys club being negative in terms of, we don't, we don't let people in who are qualified, um, and who can do everything, but we just don't like them. I, I think there's a good part of, the quote boys club in that if we expand it to the qualified club, yep. like, Hey, we're, you're, you're qualified. You I, you yeah, you I, I know who you are. Yeah. I know that you're qualified. Like, yeah, like absolutely. Like we can partner or we can work together or we're fine working alongside you or I'll do you a favor in this. But if you haven't, yeah, I don't want you in the qualified club. Yeah, So you only have yourself to blame at right. that point. Like you, you can say it's the good old boys that didn't let me in. Mm -hmm. But really what it started with was, is like, dude, you didn't meet the standard. Right. So meet the standard, whether they like you or not. And then I, I think that just creates a whole other level, kind of level of cognitive dissonance about mm -hmm. what's going on and how to be ready for these opportunities as they come up. But, the, the, uh, you know. I'm, and I think that a, a big aspect too that, that we have to touch on is reputation. And in our industry, reputation is everything, both with clients, but also internally as well. And because there's no overall regulating ranking, like there's nothing like the Ryan Reynolds, the, what, what was it, AAA certified with the, his newest movie the or the, the one with Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, it's right. like a AAA certified bodyguard. Like there's no such thing Whatever as a AAA is, certification. Yeah. There's nothing like a ranking system where, you know, like I am qualified at this level. I'm an expert marksman by the government. You know, like there's nothing. Yeah, like, what does that even mean? Yeah, like, there's, there's, Shut there's, up with that. Yeah, there's yeah. there's nothing right. like that. But what there is is, hey, I worked alongside him or I saw him on a detail or I heard from a friend that so he was good. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to trust you. Like I'm, I'm fine with, you know, working in vi the vicinity of you. But if you act like, you know, you, you know, your shit doesn't stink or you are um, you obviously incapable, like I'm not going to trust you and I'm going to tell other people too. And your reputation will precede you everywhere you go. And that is the regulator in our industry. Yeah, I think it's interesting with particularly like you're like C24 is not going to be all over Instagram doing all these high speed posts and whatever. Mm -hmm. That's just, it doesn't make any sense, right? But you're going to see a lot of these private contractors that are, you know, constantly posting pictures and reels and whatever else about the things that they're doing and how they're doing it and talking a good game and whatever else. But that's, you're, 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 it's all self-promotion. Ultimately at the end of the day, I guess, I think what you're saying is, is like, that's going to be a limiting factor at some point. Like yep. there's going to be, if your plan is to move up or your desires to move up, grow your company, uh, what are the limitations that you've already set for yourself by not meeting sort of a general standard or at least holding yourself accountable to it to some extent as you get down that, that, that professional path Things moving so fast right now. I could get where people are like, I don't need this right now. Look, mm -hmm. I got four, four new clients, yeah. you know, or whatever. I'm making all this money. Like, why do I need any it's of that? It's working for you. It what? works until it doesn't. Exactly. Right? So or there's a certain ceiling that you're going to hit. 
And that's the big thing too, is like, if you want to continue doing those, those one-on-one details where maybe it's just, you know, a certain type of client, that's fine, but you're going to limit yourself at a certain point without personal investment. And, and it's the same thing too. You know, I talk up a, a, a larger company, a lot of people come into, you know, Crisis 24, Gavin DeBecker, Patriot Group, uh, SIS, and they think, hey, they're going to provide you all of the training that you need. You know, like, okay, I'm going to go there and it's like now carte blanche. This isn't the military. It's not the government. Like, I don't just have time to send you to a school. A lot of it's still going to be personal investment. I'm going to try and get you up to a certain standard and there's going to be training that's available to you. But if you're looking for something that's major or you're looking to, to take the next step, even within a big company, there's a certain amount of personal investment you have to make, whether it's reading, self-development, you know, self-development, yeah. or it's going to courses. You know, like I set a budget for myself every year of personal investment. Like I'm going to go to X number of courses this year in these different areas. And I look at like, okay, I really want to go to something like Thunder Ranch with, you know, learn from Clint Smith. That's a bigger investment than just like a local instructor who comes to town. Um, or I want to go to, you know, learn about communications and comms. Like I'm going to go to uh, um, Mojave, uh, I forgot the- Repeater. Repeater, yeah, mm-hmm. in like Vegas and take one of their courses. Like that's a that's a bigger investment than just like sitting around and, and reading a book. So maybe it's something where we're starting out, you know, you have to do these small investments. Um, like when I started uh, in, in my career, I had to budget till I had $12 left over every month. Like that was my expenses versus this, this my is income. part of becoming an adult. Right, yep. becoming an adult, going back to it. So every two months, I every two months I could go to the movies because it was like thirty dollars to go to the movies with someone. So every two months I could go to the movies, but I also had to figure out like what can I do to get better. So I read a lot. Um, I had a lot of books. Uh, you know, that's a small investment in terms of like I can't afford to go to a three hundred dollar course. Um, and that's you know like you know that's that can be a lower end on the terms of the spectrum. One thousand percent. Uh huh. So. That's maybe a few I do, hours. Right. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I do one of those per year, or maybe I do a couple. And I save up for it, but I can also fill in the gaps with now. And that's the the great thing about smart social media now. I can learn a lot from from certain social media channels if I'm careful on who I'm following or YouTube. And I think people are getting good while we do have an influx of people just shooting their mouth off mm-hmm. and, and they're not actual um, experts or maybe they're experts, but they're relying on their past and they're not really pushing anything new. We forward. mentioned this before. Right. Yeah. But if I'm smart, I can get a lot of information for free online. And all it is, is just me, you know, again, making a YouTube account, watching a lot of videos. The instructor's getting benefits off of those videos. So that's how they're getting paid to put that content out. And that's what I can get. You know, I can look at, okay, something just happened with um, Kim Kardashian getting flour dumped on her head years ago. You know, okay. <laughs> I missed all this. So this was this was years ago. <laughs> she was on a... a um, a photo line, like a step and repeat. Okay. And someone walked up from the side, walked in front of everybody and just dumped flour on her head. And like security was nowhere to be. Yeah. Found. How does this happen is the question. Right. Yeah. And so what we did and what I did, I watched it over and over and over, over and over and over that event. I watched uh, people in my current company who, had, who were doing field details with people where they're walking from, um, you know, the, uh, through a public airport past baggage claim. Like, what are they doing right? Like, these guys are really successful for years. So what are they doing and what can I do? So that when I get that one shot, because all you're going to get is one shot. Even if you're part of a big company, you're going to get your one shot. And if you mess that up and it doesn't go well, you're not getting one for a while because that's all you get. And, and again, reputation is everything. So when I get my one shot to walk an A-list celebrity through paparazzi in an airport, I'm going to do it right because I'm going to watch people like Bill Duchesne, Matt, um, Gary Howland. Like, I'm going to watch people who have done this before. Um, a buddy of mine, Ryan Martin, was with huge client a lot. And I asked him all the time, hey, what is it that you're doing? Like, how do you do this? Like, how are you so good? And I'd watch what he did, you know, and I'd learn from it and I'd try to apply it. Um, and, and it's even soft skills. Like, he's my buddy, Ryan. He's actually a VP in, in Crisis 24 now. He can walk into a Starbucks and leave a regular. I don't know how he does it. The next time we walk in, everybody knows him and everyone knows his drink order. So I just started watching. I'd watch what he does. He uses their name. He learns something about them. He makes some comment. He finds something personal and he makes a comment and then he remembers it. So the next time he walks in, there's a little bit of like, we recognize you because you stood out from everybody else and he uses the things he remembers and all of a sudden he's a regular. And that really works. He does that everywhere he goes. And it blew my mind because it's so simple, but it was just me watching and seeing like, hey, what's working for this person? That, 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 that I'm not good at and 
YouTube, in-person, books, all of that's free. So how do you make yourself better? And then the investments you do make capitalize on them. Uh, that's awesome advice. I mean, I, I, you can use that in so many different aspects of life and in educating yourself. And that's why, you know, again, it's part of the premise of the podcast why I'm here today. And like in those kind of, those kind of nuggets, like what are you doing? Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, firearms, soft skills, hard skills, whatever else, something else you want to learn how to cook. You know, whatever, all of what you just said in terms of that framework makes perfect sense. And mm -hmm. putting yourself around, surrounding yourself with people who are being in, you know, like really like frequently being in situations where you can ask those questions and have those relationships. I mean, those are, those are things that like if, if a person has their, uh, um, you know, they, they got the wherewithal and they're putting it online, they're putting it on social media, YouTube or whatever else. It's stuff's out there for people obviously to gobble up. I wonder like with your experience, because you're not a big YouTube guy, right? You don't have a massive YouTube following, Instagram following, any I of don't. that stuff. But I wonder, like, with the little, like, like you said, the flower thing, the Kardashian flower on the head thing, like, what in your career is, like, or stories or, or incidents of, man, if I was going to make a YouTube channel, right, and I was going to put some stuff out there, what would be the things that I would talk about? Both the, you know, maybe the serious stuff, the successes, the failures, and maybe some of the in-between. Are there anything that come to mind? Yeah. I mean, we, so it's hard because you have to be careful. So uh, a big part of our protection is anonymity. Right. So like we are very, very particular on like, don't share specifics. So it's hard because some things you want to talk about, you're like, I've heard this before, you know, it's yeah. like, it, this would really like the only way for you to get a good idea of what I'm talking about is to explain the it's, person yes, yeah, to be, and then you would know who they are. But, um, no, I mean, I, there was a uh, one time that always sticks out in my head is it, it was a failure. And it was honestly like, it was one okay. that it was one that could have gone bad but it didn't, but it was still one where I was like, oh my God, like this was like, it was a gut check. So it was at a, um, a large convention. It was actually at a Comic-Con and this was years ago. Like I was really new in the field. Um, this was kind of like one of my th second or third big kind of like solo, just me. Um, and it was just me and the client I was with, I had to, for certain reasons, walk with them from the room down to the car, which was in a private loading dock. It was a, it was a, like the loading dock of a hotel, but I couldn't stay with the car and meet them. Like normally what you would do in, in this situation with a, a car and a driver is you'd have someone like a dedicated to that car to maintain the sanctity of it. So like no one gets in or messes with that car. And I, I didn't have someone who was a dedicated driver. I just knew that a car was going to be there. I set it up. And then I had to go with that client, wait for them, and then walk them down through the hotel to that car. And then you're going to leave them in the car by themselves? No, then they're... I'm getting in the car. You're going to get them in the car. Okay. So what I did is I told the guy, and this is a guy who's vested interest in being there on time. So I knew he would be there. Um, I didn't, I wasn't able to double check, texted like, hey, are you there? Yes, I'm here. We're ready to go. Good. Went, got the client walking down and opened the door for the client, put him in, closed the door, went around the other side, got in the front seat. Uh, sat down, turned around, and looked back, and there was someone in the back seat. Another person. Another in the, person. So in the you back didn't seat. you didn't check the car before didn't. you opened. So because you're trying to get him in there quickly, right? Because it was a lot of eyes were getting drawn, and I was like, okay, get him in the car. It was there was a lot going on with the person where I had to be very particular with them. Get him in the car. Close the door again. Someone, the person that I coordinated with, where I was like, hey, we're going over. It's just us. You know, I, I was I was pretty careful on my like. We're not taking anybody else. The yeah, driver, you're being very car, detailed here. I get but, you, dude. But like I put him in the car and there was a guy in the back seat. And and it was a guy who was a driver who was going to take the car because I had an event person who was pretty high up in the event driving the car over with me and the client and the, the EA, the executive assistant. He had arranged for the driver of the car who was, who was the chauffeur who normally would take the car around to all these different VIPs to pick them up for the event to ride with us over there. Okay. But I had this moment of just sinking like- Because nobody told you this. Right. And everybody, and the problem is everyone in the car kind of turned and looked and was like, Who, oh. Who's this? Hey, I didn't know someone else was going to be in the car. And I just sat there and I died. Like I just died in my seat. Um, and luckily again, I was like, and before it was before we started going, I was like, who is that? And he's like, oh, he's the driver. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was able to like sort of play it off, but also like, this is the driver. He's going to drive the car back. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. But I- This I mean, is a major I, F up on your- Huge, yeah. huge. Yeah. And it could have gone bad. And so now I'm very, part, like, again, normally someone, one of my people would be with the car if we're doing two man, but I had to have someone, my second guy had to be at the event to receive because that was the bigger risk. 
But still, like that was an issue of like, I should have. And now every time I open that door, it doesn't matter who it is. I look and I look through those backs, that, that back window, even if it's tinted, I'll take a look inside the car because I've been burned like that before. And that was a, a, one of those, it seems like everyone listening is just going to like, oh man, you should have done X, Y, Z. Yeah, sure. But it's like quarterback or armchair quarterbacking this thing. Now I, I'm not an EP. I could have said probably mm -hmm. five things and but you were doing the other 50 things right right it's like spot on right right and it was that, it was one, that thing. one thing and the problem is is that okay let's say it's not an attack like obviously we can go to like he's a ninja in the back and he stabs my client and there's a, you know obviously a fight you know client dies big issue everyone you know horrible that's not really realistic like that doesn't happen every day but what was probably more likely is like that's a fan who got in the back seat or somehow got back there and gets pictures and is obnoxious and we have to drag them out and it becomes this big thing instead you're of fired yep my your company's reputation, fired your reputation is yep. that you're garbage right because you made while i mean it's not a small mistake it's a big mistake but it was you could have made 50 other ones before mm -hmm. even after that and now you are you know Mm -hmm. You'll never live that down for the rest of your career. Right. And and I think that was the key is looking at this whole, like, let's just take that one movement from hotel room to the car. There was 50 points to your, like, let's say 10 points um, of, of potential failure. And I passed nine of them. So I got a 90%. In terms of of actual grading, you can't do that. But the one person in the car yeah. meant, meant that that was a fail, and that that one still lives with me to this day. Where I'm just like, that could have been really bad, especially for this individual. Like this could have just all been really bad. And it the what it ended up being was just an awkward car ride. And I laid into that guy later, like laid into him. Um, and I also did it strategically so that the EA also saw me lay into him. Um, and so that helped with my reputation a little because. I had been very clear on what he was supposed to do and he he deliberately didn't. And I think he was doing a favor for a buddy. And I think that his buddy was the chauffeur. And so he got to say, I rode over with X, Y, Z. But it, it, it was definitely a learning point because at the end of the day, while he contributed to that failure, it was ultimately on me because that was my job. And, and I can tell you to this day, I don't put someone in a car without knowing who's in it. Yeah, so besides that, I just wonder how you handle, like, moving on from that. Like, you just mentioned kind of what you did immediately. How, sort of in a, was there a debrief with yourself, but maybe a debrief with the rest of your team on how to handle that better? And, or how do you handle briefings differently or handle yourself differently or coach people how to handle themselves differently, aside from saying, and by the way, don't forget to look in the back of the car right. before you put something in there, because that sounds obvious. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking for maybe the, the, is, there's got to be a deeper level, obviously, of awareness that you have now. How do you take that and, and capitalize on it? Right. So there's a couple of things. So one, it was a multi-day detail. So this was, this Comic-Con was multiple days. Um, there were multiple appearances by this individual, and this was the first day. So it, it, one, it's bad because there's a reputation issue there now, but two, I was able to adjust. And so I knew then that I couldn't, I couldn't rely on the staff. I could only rely on my one other guy. And so what we did is we actually adjusted and we drove. So we drove smart front, left, front, right, the whole way. This and ain't then, happening again. And yeah. then we had another. So our trusted person was on the receiving end because I knew that we were good enough even though like I just made a rookie mistake, I knew we were good enough where if we are, were pulling up to the venue dock, uh, the, the arrival location dock is what we call it, like docking a boat. Um, if I'd pulled up to the dock and there was um, an issue, we were good enough to pivot and we were good enough to, um, you know, call an audible and either one, just bypass or two, in the car, make a very quick plan and then go, go to work as needed. So we... To me, it was, all right, let's overcome this issue where obviously I can't trust someone to keep the car safe. Um, and I'm going to have my guy drive. I'm going to sit passenger because I, I have to walk everywhere with this individual. And then we're going to move from there. And so that was the, the early move. That was my immediate debrief of like, okay, we're going to adjust our, our game plan here. And then after it was a reevaluation, and this is something I've tried to take with me because I've noticed it's a trend with EP. Like if you're good, this is a trend is concierge versus security. So Explain that. So with EP, it's very different than being a bodyguard. And that's kind of where we're, we draw the line is a, a bodyguard is, in, in, in vernacular sake, is someone who's very reactive. They're there to stop a fight or to get in the way of, of a potential physical attack. Okay. 
EP, you're looking at one is I am the executive assistant security guard, essentially. How am I going to protect this person, but also ease their life? How am I going to fulfill a lot of these different things while fulfilling my protective mission? Like, you know, um, making sure they get places on time, making sure that, um, you know, things, they're packed correctly, making sure that uh, the plane is set up for them getting in, making sure the car's set up the way they want. You know, a lot of things that are concierge related, making sure the green room has the right food, the right drinks, the right air conditioning levels, because if they're happy, my job's easier. And if they don't want to leave that location, my job is easier. They're Mm -hmm. safer. So a lot of times in driving, you know, driving smooth, driving careful, driving in the least aggressive route Mm -hmm. with not not the most potholes. Like you're not drawing attention to yourself, but you're also being efficient. So a lot of times we can veer and this is where I see a lot of people where we have to kind of draw them back in, especially home, home teams, where it's like you start to get ingrained in the the home of like, I'm I'm a full-time person at someone's house. Okay. And I'm doing things that are not security related. They're concierge and and it starts to tip towards that concierge. Like, and, like what would they be doing? Like making a run to the grocery store or walking something? Walking the dogs. Okay. So like, this hey, is part of the business. Right. And okay. so we're going to go walk the dogs. Kind of a, a fine line because if the client's going to go walk the dogs, now they're walking in public versus if I walk the dogs, they're at home. Okay. Where does that escalate to? Now I'm taking the dogs to a vet appointment. Like how how hmm. much am I doing something that an estate manager should do or a personal assistant? And I have fulfilled that role. And now I'm no longer doing security. Um, you know, things like- By uh, saying, yes, you pulled yourself out of the security role. Right. Or even just driving where I'm, I'm just focused on driving in terms of I'm going to be smooth. I'm going to be careful. I'm going to make sure I don't disrupt them. I'm going to uh, know their favorite routes, things like that. Like that's all fine. But the minute that it takes you out of what am I going to do if this happens? What if, you know, someone swerves into my lane? If I get blocked in here and I see a, you know, a crazy person coming from across uh, Market Street in San Francisco, where do I go? Like, am I able to get out? What if there's an attack? You know, like, again, I don't like to lean towards the attack all the time because that that very rarely happens, but it's, it's your job. Like your job is protection. So what if there is an attack? That person has security for a reason. And maybe it's just something simple as a target of opportunity. Um, The uh, Oakland police chief who was uh, shot at the uh, gas station, um, he was, I, I think he... He had a business. He had gone to the business. They'd followed him from the business. It was He was retired. He had a separate business. And so they're like, ah, this guy, he's driving like $110,000 Porsche. He picked up money from his business. Um, and then he stops at this gas station. So they just followed him and realized they had no idea who, who he was. was yeah. They just followed him and realized this guy's important. Same mm-hmm. thing. A lot of our clients aren't driven around in Honda Civics. None of them are. In fact, I don't know anybody who drives around the Honda Civic that's our client. At the minimum, it's like a Tesla. Right. But if you're downtown San Francisco and in Escalade, odds are that's someone important. So you could have that attack, meaning just someone who wants- The crime of opportunity. Crime of opportunity. Right. So being prepared, like, are you thinking about those things? Are you, do you know your, you know, secondary tertiary routes? What if there's a protest? What if there's this, you know, or are you just simply following ways? Mm -hmm. Um, And so- for me there, and what I realized in that situation with this client where there's someone in the back seat, numbers, you know, I'd said there were 10 points. That's an arbitrary number. Sure. But, you know, points three through seven were concierge points. Mm-hmm. And I focused a lot on those because, again, that's how I'm going to be successful in terms of my career progression is if he says, hey, you know what? That was a really good detail. I want that person. I want Devin on my next one. Now I get to go do it again. And now I have a regular client, even though I'm in a big company, I have someone who's requesting me and that raises flags with leadership. So it's like, ah, Devin's doing really well. So I focused heavy on the concierge right there and I failed at one of the security elements. Maybe as a result, maybe not one maybe, way or another. Maybe not. What you're saying, what I hear you saying is the focus was a bit unbalanced. Right. And yeah. so for me, it was a long-term pivot of, okay, I need to focus more on the security. So there's a reason I I'd done the job. I think, I, again, I was like two years in, um, two or three years in when, when I'd done these three details with this person and I'd kind of gotten comfortable. And this was one of those wake up moments where I was like, Hey, you're not as good as you think you are. Mm-hmm. Like you need to, you need to focus on what this job actually is. And the concierge is second. Like it, it, it honestly is. You can never let the concierge get in the way of protection. And that's a, that's a hard line. Like you, and, and as a leader, 
because I, you know, I went through a, pretty much every rung of leadership on my way up. I was a regional director in charge of most uh, multiple details, like nine, nine teams in the Bay Area. And it was a constant thing where like really good guys who really, like clients really liked them. It was a little bit of like pulling the reins back. Like, hey buddy, like I know the client likes you and they're requesting you to be, you know, you to drive them all over the place, pick them up from the airport, go on a trip with them. But like, you're getting a little out of control. Like let's, let's, let's tone it back. Like I need you to get back in the security mindset. And I think that's something that, is a lesson that was that was hard to learn and something that I I harp on. Probably harp is the right word on in our training is hey, it doesn't matter. Like you you can plan all these things, but do you know the route to the hospital? And I was talking to a buddy and he was like, dude, no one knows the route to the hospital. You can't tell me that every detail you go on, you know the route to the hospital in San Francisco. And I was like, no, I I don't, but I try to because mm-hmm. I've realized that that is what a professional does. And everyone, like, there's a lot of people who, oh, yeah, I, I know the routes. Like, of course I know the routes. Like, you should always know the routes. But it's one of those where, like, deep, dark, down inside, do you really care? Do you know the routes? Do you know what you're doing if there's a natural disaster? Not even, like, take the attack out of it. Like, okay. you're at a venue at, for an event with a client. What are you going to do if you need to leave? Have you thought about that? Or are you just reactive? You need to get proactive because this job is all about proactive. You know, we have what we call the projective versus protective agents. And it's kind of this 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 loose term, but it's, you know, someone who goes to an attack, like to an attacker okay. is projective. Like I'm going to go solve the problem. Protective is someone who goes to the client and moves them out of the way. So if you have a multi-person team, you can you kind can of- Different roles there. Right, yeah. different roles of like, who's doing this, who's doing this, whose job is the client. If it's one person, like your job is always the client. And we can kind of get, if we're always, if I'm a one person- uh, protective detail, I can get a bit reactive in terms of, all right, I've got so much on my plate. If something happens, I'll just, boom, I'll get on the stage, get them off the get stage. To, get and to the then, problem. Yeah. Like, obviously I'll go somewhere safe. And it's like, well, <laughs> what, what is that somewhere safe? Or like, do you have your plans in place where if this happens and it may seem uh, like a fundamental, like, of course you should, but when you do it day after day, after day, after day, after day, you start to just kind of hit rote. And it's like, hey, this is not important anymore. I don't have to work on it. So when you think of, hey, I've done, I, I've walked through every possible scenario at this one spot, but you forget to look in the car, that's still, like, that's still a potential failure. So it's, again, how do you reinforce, like, what is your actual job? And are you fulfilling the, the high points of your job? What are your priorities versus what are your not, not your priorities? I mean, I think that's a good way to look at life, man. I think that's what we're doing here. You know, we're trying to do here, with the podcast and kind of what Iron Sights is about is just getting people to think differently like mm-hmm. that. And even in their civilian non EP life, mm-hmm. you know, like, Hey, what are, what do you, are you, are, have you put yourself in a position to do things all the, the right way when the worst kind of stuff comes in your direction and, and how do you protect your family? How right. do you protect yourself? How do you be prepared for any of that? You know, and again, God forbid any of that stuff happens, but you know, wouldn't it be, well, doesn't it just make sense to spend five minutes thinking about it? But more importantly, going all the way back to the beginning of this, you said um, knocking the shine off the new mm-hmm. guys or the guys kind of moving up. Sounds like you still maybe had a little shine on you at that particular point in your career, even yep. three years in. And that was the that was the uh, the event that maybe knocked a little bit m- more off of mm-hmm. off you that you may weren't aware of at that point. And you were able to sort of self-evaluate and self-correct as a result rather than losing your job and having to kind of recover from that or you know, being fired or right. whatever else. I think it also, it goes the opposite direction too. Like you, 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 you pass a point where you knock the shine off and you're, you're really hit your prime, but then there's also a point where you start to get rust. So that, like, yeah, that's what I was just mm-hmm. going to say. And so even if you are in that much, yeah, Scott, I hear you, man, I'm that guy, you know, mm-hmm. like, and you know, I am confident. And if this happens and that happens, I'm going to be ready, but are you, and what are you doing to train? Mm-hmm. Right. And test that. Uh, you know, you, you can go through the scenario in your head, but are you getting out, you know, and, and, and you training? Are you physically fit, right? Are you are you met staying mentally aware? And how? What are the things that you are doing from a from a mental perspective to keep continue to challenge your mind? Uh, are, you know, are, is your first aid kit up to date? Did you? Has it been sitting in the hot car for three summers now, and all that stuff in there just you know crispy and it's not going to be effective? Like, have you gone through there and revisited that? Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. The firearms training is one thing. Again, the physical, you know, self-defense stuff is another. When was the last conversation you had with your your kid or your partner, or your wife about, you know, th- this particular s- scenario or what you experienced or, you know, you know, 
when I get to the, when we get to the gas station, we pull up to the gas pump, you know, Mm -hmm. like this is how we should be handling ourselves just in case, you know, like, and I think the interesting thing too, I think that's, that's a hard conversation, like pivoting away from just executive protection. Um, that's a hard conversation to have for people who that's not their job. Um, even if it's something you're passionate in, like, let's say it's like, you know, you are a computer, um, coder, which that's a foreign language. I have no idea. Yeah, I have no, I, idea. I have no idea how to do that. So that's, that's crazy. That's cool. But let's like, let's say you're, you're passionate about firearms. You're passionate about personal security. Like that's, that's awesome. But some people don't view it as that important or it's like that, well, it'll never happen to me. Or like, ah, this is weird. Like you're, you're a nerd. Like you're nerding out on like being security aware. It's a tough conversation to have, but it's the same thing that we touched on earlier of the preparation is key. Like for, for my job and, and the, the jobs of people around us is, is preparation is what's going to set them up to, for success. The most important part of a protective detail is the advance. Are you preparing ahead of time for what's going to happen? Have you talked to everybody? Do you know your routes? Do you know your, your, your primary, secondary, tertiary for your communications, your medical, your routes themselves, your evacuation points, the car? Have you thought about what happens if the car goes down? Like all of these things are all preparation. And if you do a lot of it and you do it well, the event is super easy. Um, and it's the same thing with, I think, uh, you know, people who, who it's not their job is personal security or security for anything. It's easy to kind of relegate that and say, you know what, it's not that big of a deal until something happens. And then if you haven't prepared even a little bit, like had a pre-conversation in place, then you're behind the eight ball and you're, and you're, you're even reactive. if it's in your own head, right? Yeah, even if it's in your right. own head. Yeah. And that's the thing that we do on details, which I think is an important tool that people can take with them in their normal life is uh, it, it, it comes out of uh, Gavin DeBecker's book, The Gift of Fear, which um, is a great book. I, I think people should read it um, who are, are, are interested in personal security. Um, it's not necessarily a, a secu- like if you want his like executive protection book, just two seconds, like that's the textbook. Um, but like his Gift of Fear is good for you know, people who are just generally interested in, in uh, personal security. And one thing he touches on is being in the now. And like we harp on it. And, and when we were with Gavin, we harped on it and we harp on it still because it's a good concept. And it's kind of gotten one of those, like, it's a joke now, like, oh, are you in the now? But it's true. Like, are you thinking currently? And everybody, like, if you're at a lecture, you're going to start zoning out, you know, like, so how do you keep yourself engaged? Mm-hmm. Same thing. Like I'm on hour number 18. I've heard the speech my client's given 20 times before I can, I've, I can help deliver the speech. I listened to him write the speech. Like I, I helped him write the speech, you know, maybe, but if, if I can't stay in the now, if I can't stay present, I'm not able to do my, my job. So you play games with yourself. Hey, what happens if the girl in the second row jumps up and screams something? What am I going to do? What happens if someone, you know, jumps up and runs the stage? What happens if someone starts heckling him from the crowd? What happens if this, what happens if this, and you, but you don't do it generally, you pick somebody, Hey, that person caught my eye for some reason. So like, what is it that they did? Or what if this happens? It's like that, the matrix, the girl in the red dress, Yeah, you were distracted by this. Mm -hmm. So turn it into something that brings your, your attention back. The, the human mind is not capable of operating at that hundred percent attention all the time. Mm-hmm. It's like, a skill. It's right. a skill you have to develop. So how do you, how do you peak and, and valley through that? It's mm-hmm. the same thing. I think for, for people who aren't in, who aren't working executive protection, when you get out of the car at the gas station, look around you and start playing games, put the pump in instead of getting on your phone and scrolling through TikTok or Instagram, which are like the biggest time sucks and attention sucks I've ever seen. Like I'm guilty of it. Um, where I just, I get on Instagram and I just start going Ten and all of a later. sudden I look yeah. like it happened at lunch today. I was on, on Instagram, like eating. And then I looked up and I was like, I haven't looked up in two minutes, you know, just like my attention. And that's what it's designed to do because yeah. that's what sells. So instead of doing that, start playing games. Like, Hey, what happens if the, the, um, someone in the, the store starts robbing it or what happens if, you know, my dad who's in the car starts having a heart attack. What do I do? You know, what happens if I do this in traffic? Like what happens if I see an accident? What do I need to do? I drive a manual transmission. So I need to put that sucker in neutral. Otherwise, if I get out of the car, you know, there's going to be, my car's going to keep going. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like put it in neutral, e-brake, uh, the medical kits in the trunk. So I'm going to have to run to the trunk, make sure I have my keys on me because my trunk won't open without the keys that the car's on. So like I play games in my head of like, what happens if I need to do this? Mm-hmm. What happens if I need to, what happens if there's a, you know, a shooting on the side where this cop just pulled someone over? What happens if that guy starts getting out and shooting? Oh man, those are all very, you know, and it's like 
it's a small game. And instead of just zoning out to the radio, it's a game. So turn it into a game of like, what happens at this? And I think that's a way that you can start trying to do it is keeping yourself engaged. But to your point, like with your significant other, whoever that is, or the person that's with you, you know, what do you do if this happens? My wife did it. We went to um, Shoreline Amphitheater in um, wherever it is, Palo Alto Mount or, Mount or, whatever, or something. Yeah. Just up the um, road. Yeah. And we, uh, we were watching uh, some concert, Thomas, Thomas Rhett, the most recent Thomas Rhett concert. And she's gotten really good at it. Like she surprises me sometimes where she used to just kind of not pay attention. But now she's like, hey, what happens if someone starts shooting? What do we do? And I was like, okay, well, yeah. here's what we're going to do. <laughs> you know, but it was like it, out of nowhere before the concert started, she right. was just like, hey, what happens if, if she's this ahead of the on? game? Yeah. And it was just a simple like, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to turn around and run up that way. Like there's like, we can get through that, that small fence and we're going to go that exit route. route yeah. um, everyone else is going to go to the exits. We're going there. And it was like, okay, cool. And now we feel better because we have a plan. And it was as simple as that. You don't always have to be the guy who's sitting facing the front door. Like that's not, that's unrealistic. That's kind of one of those like ninja things where it's like, yeah, you're, you're cool. But like, and some people like you need to do that. That's fine. But odds are that it's not going to be someone coming in the front door starting to shoot the place up. It's the person behind you who like takes a steak knife and stabs his wife in a domestic violence dispute. So don't think just because you're facing the door, nothing else is going to go on. That you got it covered. Yeah. So take a look. And if you have to have your back to the door because like you had reservations, it's the only table available. Just think about, okay, like what am I going to do if this happens? Or watch my wife's eyes. And if she starts to like get panicked and look over, like I'm going to take a quick look too. Like something drew her attention. But like, play those games and be engaged. And that's half, that's over half the battle is just being engaged. And that's the same for executive protection too, is just because you got them safely to whatever temporary destination you're at, you're not done. We're not done. Yeah. You're not done until you're back in your hotel room and you've checked out. And even then, if you're on a multi-day detail, like, is your phone, is your phone on ring? Is your like, like I've been that guy where my phone was on silent. And I woke up to like two missed calls. Luckily, they were within like six minutes of me waking up because the vibration woke me up. Mm. But that was another gut check of like, hey, he, he called and he wanted something in the middle of the night. You know, I'm four hotel rooms down and my phone was on silent. Mm. Like, what happens if I hadn't woken up? I, I, these are all like, I mean, it's the same. Like whether you're a dad on a trip and your family's at home by themselves and you know, they need you, right? Mm-hmm. Like your, your phone's on silence sitting on the, on the hotel room, Yep. you know, or, uh, you know, I've stayed in some pretty shitty hotel rooms, man, where, you know, like I just real, real bad spots for whatever the reason was. And my bag's ready to go, man. Yep. If I got to get out of there, like <laughs> it's yep. packed. I'm basically sleeping in my clothes. Like the bag is packed. The firearm is, is there. Mm-hmm. Like my keys are ready to go. The key fob is ready to go. And I can get out that door and get the hell out of there if I need to. But, and that's a good point is just leaving. Like we see it a lot. We just watched a video, me and my wife last night, uh, waiting for, we, we flew in from a, a, a wedding we were at and we were stuck in the tarmac and we were watching Instagram videos in the plane. And it was a guy who in New York uh, was in a, some sort of like altercation with some young kids. And it was this older guy who looked a little, maybe transient kind of, um, and some young kids. And it was in a McDonald's. And like, I think what happened is they somehow escalated it. Uh, and then they started hitting him. And one is they threw punches so poorly that like the guy just stood there and took them. Mm -hmm. And it was like, dude, if you're going to start, like you better finish that. But uh, he then said, okay, let me go. I'm going to go get something out of my bag. And at that point I was like, whoa, like this is escalating. He went to his bag and he pulled out an ax uh, and he started just going to town. Luckily he was using a blunt end and he just started hitting people and no one left. They all just stood, just stood there with their They'd phones all just stood up there. Or, people yeah. were filming yeah. in the, the McDonald's and people who were sitting around, like the people he was going after were just sitting there. They were like just bystanders. Hoping, they were just hoping like, please, like I know I was just yelling at you, but like, please don't. And he ended up hitting some of them, knocked some of them out of the chair. He was in the face of one of the guy's girlfriends, like screaming at her. And the guy just sat there and we were like, why don't you leave? Like, who cares at that point? Just leave, leave, get out <laughs> of the situation. But everyone just stayed and it was like, no, like half, like you will succeed. Just get out, Yeah, get out and deal with it later. Like, and so your point of like your bag is in your hotel room. Like if something's going on, a lot of people want to like bunker, like hunker down, bunker up and just stay in spot. A lot of times being mobile is going to be effective there and just leave. Same with when we're with clients. Sometimes it's just like, Hey, we're done here, sir. We're leaving. Like it's time to go. We're not going to like, let's go back to the room for a second and then we can come back out and do something. But we're not going to stay and fight it out or wait for these people to spill over. To figure it out. Yeah. It, it's the, uh, you know, obviously the best, the best thing is to not put yourself in that situation in the first, first place, but you don't always have that choice. And often things 
oftentimes things can escalate quickly. Like mm-hmm. you just, you just said, and yeah, get the hell out of there. Run mm-hmm. again, be physically fit, be nimble, be mm-hmm. able, be able bodied. And it's, it's and mindset. Know, know who may not be around you so that you can help them if, if they need be. Right. And it's, it's mindset too. And this is something we've, we've working on with training is we have a lot of people coming from a lot of backgrounds, you know, guys who are former military, um, whose job has been very offensive, mm-hmm. you know, like they are the ones kicking in the door. Right. They have a team going with them. They're going in guys who are police officers who like, they can't because of their job, let people walk over them. So they, they, if they receive confrontation, they're not going to back down because their safety for, you know, 10, 15, 20, sometimes 30 years has been, no, I'm going to win this situation. The confidence, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. In EP, that's not always the case. Like one is you're not offensive, you're reactive a lot of times. Um, the very rare will you be offensive. Uh, the second thing being like, uh, it's fine, you're going to get walked over. And sometimes that's the best thing is to let someone think they've won, let them walk away. Your ego is, in, is mm. you know, shattered on the ground, but you've now deflected attention away from your client or that person looks like the bad guy and you've de-escalated the situation so that they've left. Sometimes what we've seen is that people coming in with experience that contradicts it, it's so ingrained in them and they have so much habit that we end up causing issues with our protection because they've escalated a situation unnecessarily or they're acting as if they have a team around mm-hmm. them when they don't. So it's a very big on us for training. It's not just training you in skills because you may have a lot of the skills. You may be a competition shooter or be you know former ranger or former whatever. whatever. Yeah, You may be advanced medically trained. You may be great at de-escalation, but your mindset has to shift to you're now a civilian. You don't have a badge. I don't, I'm not counting your Leosa retired badge because that doesn't count anymore. Mm-hmm. Like regardless of what it wins you with other PD when they arrive to deal with the situation, you don't have any more authority than the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Military, you don't have a team. Like you're not offensive. You don't have the jurisdiction just to go in and take care of problems. So you're a civilian now. And how do you handle that in situations where if you duke it out or you don't back down, you're affecting your client. I would say this, I mean, in listening to the way you just explained that, the EP side and the skills that you're just talking about teaching or ingraining into people that have been offensive, mm-hmm. those are skills that people need to be focused more on instead of spending maybe so much time on the shooting range, right? Mm-hmm. And trying to do the cool shit that the ranger is doing or the LEO the is doing or whatever else and developing all those skills all the time. Like, what are you doing to be in a situation or to, to set yourself up for situational awareness, de-escalation, uh, all of the other things, right? Mm-hmm. How to be mobile uh, and get the hell out of there. Uh, how to, how to be proactive rather than reactive, uh, because yeah, the sexy shit over here, you know, getting out and, mm-hmm. you know, doing whatever out on the on SWAT the, rolls and death blossoms. Y- yeah, like, yeah, man, all that kind of stuff. Like it's cool. And I think they're important skills, but they're, you know, how much, how are you weighting your training? Right. And more importantly, your mindset uh, right. to that training. Um, all, all super important. I think, you know, takeaways from, from this conversation. And I think obviously for somebody that may be getting into the role of VP, that coming into it from somewhere else, whether it's coming in with no LEO mill background or whatever else to those that are and are looking for, or maybe thinking about it and curious and moving into it. So I imagine you guys are constantly looking for new talent. We are um, I mean, yep. you're, you're all the time, all the time. All the time. And so what's the best way for, um, for you or what do you recommend that, that, uh, that folks do that are maybe curious about it, or maybe you've had some experience in doing it or really looking at maybe coming down this career path. What are the first steps? How do they get in touch with, you know, the, uh, the C24 guys, what, what do they do? Yeah. So I know that's a really good question. I appreciate you asking. Um, it, it's, it's simple, a uh, website crisis24.com. Um, you can get online. You can see everything we do from the analytical side to the protective side. Uh, LinkedIn is huge. Like get in, getting connected to myself, Nick Duchesne, who's, um, one of our veteran advocates, but he's really big on employee engagement. Um, he's a 22 year first sergeant. He's a network that's insane. So even if we don't have a fit for you, like maybe you're out of Oklahoma and you don't want to move, and we're just like, hey, we don't have a job for you. He's very big on like, okay, let me help you find a job. Because mm, okay. um, again, getting you placed well benefits us as, as well yep. too. Um, so LinkedIn is huge. Is start reaching out, start asking. Um, general admission form on our website, obviously. Reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to field questions or, or things like that. I'm not a proactive. To your point, I don't have a YouTube following. My social media isn't isn't hugely forward focused but I try and make time when someone reaches out to ask a question to at least have a phone call. Um, in terms of skill set, like 
we are very open to everybody. And I think that's the key with EP is that if you're looking for someone like your SEAL Team 6 guys are maybe not the best EP people mm-hmm. in the world for what we're doing. You know, like what really has served us well is people who are able to have a normal conversation, but want to have those, like that, that stance of, I want to protect people. They have that, that initial interest of like, I really want to protect people. And then they have the ability to have normal conversations, to interact, to blend, um, and then to amp up as needed. Cause I can, I I can teach you all the skills. Like what we can send you to defensive tactics training. There's things we can recommend. We, We can show you how to shoot a gun. Like all those things we can teach you. Obviously it's easier if you have a basis in it, but like we have people who are former, former florists, um, for people who are former, um, bellboys at, uh, the four seasons who have succeeded remarkably in our company simply because they understand customer service. Yeah. Yep. And they don't have a chip on their shoulder. You yeah. know, like they don't have that. I've been there mentality. Um, so I think even if you have been there and you have done that, come in with the idea of like, n- come in with the idea that nothing I know is going to apply. Mm-hmm. Cause then you're going to be positively surprised when something does apply. Um, but if you just come in and you learn and you don't have this, even if you have a little bit of experience, be open and, and say, okay, I'm here to learn everything and, and the, the way it should be done and, and look at guys who are doing it in the field well. Not your guys who are on necessarily on social media all the time yep. who are- Who say they're doing it well. Yeah, yeah, or say they're doing it well. Like if you get a job, look at the teams who are really squared away or the teams that are on high level people because those people have been vetted and mm-hmm. go, okay, I, I like what they're doing. Or- I didn't really like that. Like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that worked very well. All right. We'll adapt and do it better. Um, and then, yeah, like take the opportunities as they come and you may, maybe you don't qualify for a job with, with us. Like we have different tiers. So like you will, you'll qualify. Like we have entry level as well as guys who are like going to the second, you know, most at risk person in the world. Like we have these different tiers so that there's odds are you will be able to slot in somewhere in our company, Mm -hmm. but maybe you don't for whatever reason, or maybe it's just not something you can facilitate, but get experience where you can. And then always, again, that, that point of you get one shot and that one shot turns into a second and then a third. Mm-hmm. And maybe that third one turns into eight shots right. because you get all of a sudden the bubble bursts, you know? So really, really set yourself up for success in like, you know, your open source research of how do I do this? What's an advance? You know, I heard these concepts talked about in this one podcast I listened to, like, I can't pay for Byron Rogers course. I can't take 30 days off work to go to covered six or ESI, but I can watch YouTube on my breaks as a you know computer engineer, or I can talk to the guy who walked in with whatever company CEO and he's chilling in the break room. And I'm, I'm interested in this and I'm a computer engineer. Go talk to that guy and be like, Hey, what, how do you do this? What do you do? I heard this term. Like, what is it? And then grow from there. Um, I think that's the big thing. I, those are such great nuggets, man. I think I love how you started with the LinkedIn piece too, because what you're talking about is being a professional, mm-hmm. right? And while, I mean, even in my business there, I'm fielding questions and, and things through Instagram or Facebook or whatever, because it's a, you know, it that's our, our industry lives there to some extent, like be a professional, start connecting with professionals as a professional. I don't want to say fake it till you make it, but become a professional, you know, mm-hmm. demand of yourself to be a professional. LinkedIn's a great place to do that. It'll give you, it's a place and a space for a much different type of conversation. And think about the, uh, I guess the impression you're giving somebody going back to you get one shot, mm-hmm. right? So if you're reaching out to somebody for, for that EP job, no matter what your background is or isn't like how you handle yourself in that first, again, impression, which sounds maybe lame. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. Um, I love that you're moving people there to get people to think like that because I don't think a lot of the A type, you know, maybe ex operator, ex, you know, ex cops, whatever, are probably playing in that field right now. They're seeing their buddies, they're seeing these people be on Instagram and YouTube and whatever else, and that's kind of where they're dominating. Mm-hmm. But all of them have, all of them have profiles, or you know, the most successful professionals are going to have profiles elsewhere because that's how the professional world tends to interact from a social perspective. Right. Um, so I love that, man. I love that. Man, I, look, th- this conversation, I think, just it spreads so much further than executive protection. I mean, it, we've talked about some personal development. We've talked about professional development. We've talked about scaling business, the challenges that exist for small and large, thinking long-term as a professional, getting in and the direction you're coming at it with, how to overcome maybe not having the resource that, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you, you mentioned sort of the open source stuff that you can go to and how how valuable that stuff is and that you value it. So if you value it, certainly somebody that, that it 
isn't at that same level or is trying to make up should should take and heed that advice. I love it. I've been enlightened on a, on, on a ton of things, and I love the comparisons you were making there across sort of what the private contract uh, EP world looks like with with regard to more of the corporate world and the things that are happening there. Um, ultimately, these worlds collide, you know, at some point, mm-hmm. uh, and they're moving probably towards one another at a very rapid w- rate is what I'm sort of gathering. Yeah. Um, and while there will be plenty of pie for everybody out there, uh, those that want to remain successful for the longer term are going to realize that mm-hmm. and they're going to understand how to play in that world. That doesn't mean you, you have to join on with one of these big companies, but I think it's important to know how to speak the language and play in that in that in that world and have respect regardless of what end you're coming from. So mm-hmm. that, that was super valuable for me to hear um, and, and hopefully for others. I appreciate you taking time, dude. This yeah. was fun. No, thank you for having me on. This was this was great. I'm, I'm a nerd about this stuff, so I love talking about it. And <laughs> uh, uh, you know, anything that I can share is always always appreciated. So this is this is great. Well, you mentioned you got your LinkedIn profile out mm-hmm. there, so that's probably one of the better places to go reach out to yep. from a professional perspective. I would absolutely. imagine. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And then you know, obviously through our our website or, or email. I think my email's on LinkedIn as well. So um, absolutely, always reach out uh, in in message me or whatever it's called. DM me. I don't know what it's called. Um, and, I, and I'll get back to you, you know, a hundred percent phone call, e- virtual meeting, whatever the deal is. Like I, I'm passionate about this and my job is helping people succeed in my company. But also if we better the whole industry, like that, that's a success for us. So huge about having conversations all the time. Well, I appreciate you having this one yeah. and uh, let's get out and train together soon. Man. Absolutely. No, absolutely. <laughs> like, that would be great. Thanks again, man. Yeah. No, thank you. I appreciate it.